must die young. Welcome to Industry Interview number two with the Outcast Creative. I'm uh, one of your hosts for the evening, Lance Nielsen, and I'm one of the co-founders of the Outcast Creative, along with Dickon Tolson, who is not here this evening. Uh, I'm joined by the lovely V Marshall. Is it V Marshall or Vi? Oh, stop it. Okay. <laughs> Hello, um, I'm V Marshall. And, uh, this is obviously uh, Lince Nielsen. Uh, yeah, that's from the good. Outcast Creative. <laughs> hi, hi everybody. Thanks very much. You're quite your your light's quite dark for some reason, but um, I haven't got a professional lighting setup yet either. I've only just got a professional microphone. Um, but today we're going to be interviewing um, two different filmmakers from uh, different continents. In fact, um, one of whom uh, Simon Cox will be bringing on um, shortly. For those people who are new to the channel, uh, we've had a lot of subscribers uh, after our last interview last a couple of weeks ago with Jason Fleming. Uh, on behalf of all of the Outcast Creative, we would just like to say thank you. Thank you so much for subscribing to the channel. Uh, do tell other people about it. We want to help the channel grow um, and we'd like to get those subs up as quick as we can. I also want to extend a heartfelt thank you to our guest co-hosts last week, the critical drinker, Will Jordan himself and uh, the Man of Mystery, uh, Mauler, who are both um, very successful YouTube critics and make very interesting uh, points and um, uh, criticism about films and shows that are coming out uh, today. Um, and they're also not short to lavish the good stuff with praise either. Uh, so my co-host tonight is a fellow member of the Outcast Creative, V Marshall, who's had quite an interesting um, history from music journalism to acting to producing and a whole host of um, other things. Um, the Outcast Creative has members all over the world. Most of us work in the creative industry, whether we're writers, directors, actors, cameramen, makeup artists, um, novelists, uh, and everything in between. So our industry interviews will focus on different aspects of the, the creative industries, be that film, theater, television, uh, or indeed stage. Um, and tonight we're looking uh, predominantly at indie filmmaking and crowdfunding and whether it's a viable platform um, for filmmakers any further. And our two guests have both used crowdfunding to get their independent feature films made. Um, some people may call them low budget features. Um, depends what your definition of low budget is. Uh, so um, V, do you want to say anything uh, more about yourself or indeed that topic before we bring our first guest in? Uh, no, I'll, I'll head straight over to you. I'm, I'm, really, uh, <laughs> I'm really interested in what they've got to say. Oh, fantastic. Um, because I've, well, I've traditionally gone, the, I've traditionally gone um, the corporate route to get things funded. Um, yeah, well, we can talk about the, the, we can talk, you know, we can touch on that subject as well um, tonight. Uh, mm. All right. Okay. Well, uh, let's bring in our first guest, none other than the fantastic Simon Cox, the director of Invasion Planet Earth. I'm going to bring him into the stream now. Um, oh, hello. <laughs> here he is. Hello. Hi. Nice to see you. V. Simon, it's lovely to see you again. Hi, Simon. Um, hello. Mate. hello. You're, you're, you've still been sent to Coventry, as I understand it. That's where I live for, near it. <laughs> let's, let's change the layout of this a little that's bit. That's better. That's better. I felt I was a bit squished. Yeah, we it was a bit squishy. Ah, there we go. That's better. That's there we go. Okay. Okay. As you can tell, this is only our second live stream. We're still we're still uh, don't let him direct. I tell you. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> so um, is this Brady Simon, Bunch? If, it is. <laughs> we're on Brady Bunch mode now. So Simon, before we get into maybe. Um, you know, what inspired you to become a, a director and the challenges of uh, getting your first feature film uh, funded. 
um, which is now, um, I guess it's on general release almost worldwide, Invasion Planet Earth. Let's show the trailer of Invasion uh, Planet okay. Earth, which is uh, the newer trailer, I believe. Um, not as good as the last trailer, because the last trailer had that guy in the tank in it. Um, yeah, sorry, sorry. He's, he's, yeah. <laughs> we'll talk about that in a minute. He had to go, he had to go. Let, let's have a look. <laughs> go on then. Station, this is Mission Control Houston. You should have a clear visual status any minute now. And to add to that, this, this mysterious thing has appeared in the sky. Maybe they can enlighten us on what the hell is going on up there. Each enemy ship is fully loaded with heavy weaponry. They're invading. Repeat, they are invading. President Waterman has warned the governments of the world to brace themselves. We have to learn the hard way by losing everything we've ever known. And then step forward into the new world. Well, hey. Well, there you go. I have to admit, I think, I think that trailer is probably the best version. It's um, actually, it's actually a bit dated now. Uh, that was when we released it in Australia. Well, let's let's go take it back a bit. I got a lot of stick. I've had a lot of stick about this film. A lot of people loved it, but it's a very low budget film, made by a very small team of people, and it's had it had loads of kind of negative stick on um, well everywhere really. Um, so um, when it was released in Australia, the Australian uh, guys marketing it said, "They just got to take it on the chin, mate." But let's turn it into an advantage. That, sorry, that was a terrible Australian accent. They decided to turn the negativity into a positive thing, and uh, and and it, that was the that was the result. And it was about you know um, obviously COVID, the year of COVID, and that sort of thing. So um, it, and it worked a treat. It worked a treat, and uh, the Australian. Press were a lot nicer than, than the Brits have been. So, I mean, okay. turning it to the topic of crowdfunding, which, I mean, we'll, we'll talk about, I suppose, in more general terms. Yeah. Um, because a lot's changed um, since you first started uh, on the journey to get what was originally called Kaleidoscope Man, now Invasion Planet Earth made. Um, you turned to crowdfunding platforms to get the film funded in what year? Uh, 2012 was my first, that was the one I jumped in. But and that was, was after 10 years of bashing my head against the brick wall, trying to get it funded traditionally. The traditional, the traditional route. Yeah, yeah. And and I had, I had made another movie, made a movie in um, 98, 1998. So, I, and I had a track record and it made money, and, but I just couldn't get this one funded. So that, that was, was um, that was a horror film, wasn't it? Well, it, it was a sort of TV horror film. It was called uh, Written in Blood. Yeah. Right. Horror is a bit, I'd call it a, psych a psychological supernatural thriller, really. Right, okay, okay. And so you, you, you made, sorry, you made one feature film. I forgot about yeah. that one, I do confess. No, um, you're not the only one. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you couldn't get the traditional route. So 2012 no. comes around. I know you and I both stood up at the London Screenwriters Festival in a foolhardy manner and, and committed we to did. making it. Well, to be honest, I mean, I, I was already, I was already making it. It was just you like, were, yeah, you told that me. was the icing on the cake. I mean, that's how long it's been years and years it, it took to make. Um, so, so uh, Indiegogo and Kickstarter were the ones around well, in 2012, were they? Well, it just come on board. I mean, you've got to remember, in 2012, Facebook and Twitter and social media generally was very new, and and yeah. I'd always wanted to think, how can I get directly to an audience? Um, now I'd been going to memorabilia shows sci-fi events for years and i've been 
meeting people and I knew there was a big audience and I've been collecting names and email addresses and things. But so I knew there was an audience for it. But th the problem I had was convincing the investors at that stage. Uh, the, the film industry just I just I don't know. I just couldn't get anything, any help from anybody. Um, and then, you know, as we started to see social media, I thought, wow, this is a you know, I can I can hit lots of people, lot, you know, um, at the same time. And right. so I started, you know, before Kickstarter and Indiegogo came along, I was putting videos out saying, hey, I'm trying to raise money. But it, but it wasn't, I didn't, there wasn't the infrastructure there. And then I saw some guys doing it on Kickstarter. So I, I tried to do Kickstarter. And of course, you know, I put the full budget on there and put it out on, to my 200, wasn't even that many people, friends that I had on Facebook. And, and it failed. But I managed to raise a just over five thousand pounds, but being Kickstarter, you don't get the money if you don't hit your target. But I thought, well, they're still there, so um, I, I did it again. But what I decided to do was shoot the film in phases because I thought, well, I could shoot it in chunks, just the nature of the story. And um, and 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 then so I set it at five grand. I thought, let's try and raise five grand, and it was really, it was really, really a great experience. I really enjoyed it. Um, five hundred people chipped in and we made 7200 or something um and then we sh and then i thought well i need to get a bigger crowd so i shot one of the crowd scenes that you see in the movie there in the trailer and we got all these people turned up in central birmingham they literally closed off the streets lights and cameras tweeted and facebook like crazy and then um lots and lots of people turned up 900 people turned up actually and we gave yeah. up flyers and most of them next day signed up to the facebook page so suddenly, you know, the audience was growing and because they'd had such a great experience on the film, um, they, uh, you know, they, they, be they became committed sort of followers and stuck with me right to the end. And there's still a lot of them are still friends now and still supporters and that. It's, it was fantastic. Um, so um, you use Click Kickstarter for the film exclusively or did you try? I other no, I did initially. So I did the first one for seven. That was great. I did a second one. Now, this is probably quite soon, two or three months after. And I, I, I raised the bar 20, 20 grand, didn't hit it, failed again. And there's such hard work. I thought, I can't keep failing at this. You know, that was the third the third one I'd done. So I went to Indiegogo. And uh, with Indiegogo, I don't know if it's the same now, but if you didn't hit your target, you pay, you, you got your money, whatever you'd raised, but they took a higher percentage um yeah. and uh, and so i did i did another seven campaigns over two years well sorry seven campaigns in all and we raised nearly 50 grand over that period it was it was incredible but it was enough for me to get a lot of the movie shot um and and at that point larger investors would you know they i, I was i was very visible bigger investors came on board and and ultimately um we got it we got it made but it took nearly to you know Took eight years, I, you know. I think you had a few private donations once the momentum for the project got. A bit Honestly, more. people, were, this this lovely lady, um, Diane, if you're watching, thank you so much. She she was actually local. She saw me in the local paper. She would just kept putting money. She, one day she put a thousand pounds through my door, right. which was just like I mean, in a check, not 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 great watch of cash, but that was like wow. And I just you know I was just blown away, and I. I got her in the film and just whatever I could. Um, and then at one point, um, we'd shot most of the film, but we had the scene. There's a there's a bit set on an alien planet, which we shot in Lanzarote. Yeah. Um, Simon, our lead man, was just moving to L.A. And I was really concerned because I it was just taking ages to do. Um, I was concerned if he goes to L.A., get him, he, I, I might lose him. So I just asked all of our Facebook backers and said, look, I need to raise some money really quickly. Can you help? And and, I, and and it was just an email and um, 20 grand came in over, it was Christmas week. A bunch of people put a grand in here. So one guy put in uh, five grand, he's a, he's a legend. And, uh, and, we, and we did it suddenly. So we, 11 of us flew out to um, Lanzarote for a couple of days and we shot all the scenes we needed. It was yeah, I remember it was remarkable. That. Yeah, it so was I mean, really good. By that stage, I guess you one of the important things was you'd taken time and you'd built a core following. and and. I think uh, something that people forget is you've really got to engage with your your following your core fan base because you were doing podcast after podcast on the actual doing... films website. If you were building a prop, there was a video about it. 
and yeah, I, I, your money, I, you did a video thanking them, and you were really. I, I tried to be as as honest and visual as possible, and and you know, I, I it's really strange actually. When I first went in, it was like you've got to get all the numbers, you've got to get the people, and then I realised actually, if I just relax, enjoy it, keep talking about what we're doing. And I mean, I'm generally quite an enthusiastic person anyway, and that that seemed to come across. Um, and yeah. I just I just kept saying, hey, we've just done this. Hey, we've done that. Or if there was a problem, it's like, oh, sorry, this hasn't worked out. We're going to try this. People were just so amazingly supportive. And it, it, it wasn't a great it wasn't a great effort. I mean, I had to a lot of people would, would contact me and I'd have to remember who I'd spoken to and make sure I, you know, if I made a promise, that's try and deliver it. And I struggled when you got 500 people, I did struggle to deliver everything that I promised but I, you know I tried to but at least I, I was very straight with people and I was I, I, I'm not I don't like writing great long blogs you know so I would just do a little video two or three minute video yeah um, and whenever we filmed uh the lovely Ian Dangerfield one of my friends would be there with his camera just filming yeah. behind the scenes so I'd cut a little film together and I'm an editor and that's what I've, I've been an editor for years so I'm very good at putting these little kind of small packages together and, and putting them out so yeah, it was really good. Just to yeah. pick up on something you said when you, when you said you struggled to fulfil some things, are we talking about perks on a Kickstarter platform? Like, no, uh, uh, um, well, first, no, uh, yeah, yes, I'll tell you what. No, no, generally those the perks that I put out, you know, per campaign, I delivered on. Where I struggled was we got the movie out. I, I promised lots of DVDs to people. Right, we got yeah, the movie that out. Was tricky, that's got, always a tricky one. When well, what I didn't realise was. They're actually quite expensive, and I, I was so broke. The people think, you know, we were we. I, I, I was absolutely maxed out. I was struggling to pay the mortgage. This is just before the film's released. The DVD comes out, and I'm absolutely broke. So I'm like, oh, we've got to. I've got to go out and work and earn some money. And I just couldn't afford to. to even, the odd thing is, you pay for the DVDs. Um, you know, you pay for them, but, but, but it was coming out of what we were making. So I yeah. never actually was, I wasn't able to get my hands on to anything for a, like a good year into it. So um, a lot of people didn't get the DVD. I did send them all links and I said, I'm really sorry. Yeah, that reminds me. I haven't had my DVD. Yeah, got to go. Is that <laughs> <laughs> you got in the tank, mate. You, you get the best part of this guy. Yeah, um, for those people watching, I had a cameo. Simon was had such a big epic journey with this, this film, and um, uh, which we also premiered the trailer of at my premiere, which we'll talk about. Both you and Matthew are on, and um, uh, and I kept seeing all these different pictures of shoots. And I, uh, most people don't know that I started out as an actor. And I was like, oh, Simon, you must have something for me on there. Can I kind of come on and do one line? I'll come up. Don't worry about paying me. You even paid me for the day, though, man, which was so. Did lovely. I? Jesus, yeah, you did. I, I said, no, don't no. pay me. I'll I'll, I'll look, put the money back in the film. But I got a check from you, so. Um, and so um, I, I did try and pay all the actors. Well, I had to pay all the actors. I wanted to. I, I didn't pay the nine hundred extras. Um, well, I put. A big no, I paid everybody. I tried to. You know, I was really, but, really because it's not professional for me. It's otherwise, it's like an amateur. Which just what's the point in? You've got to pay people. No, no, no. Much, I, you know. Yeah, I, I, well, we can get into that as well. In well, a thank you for bringing that up, Lance. That's really good to know. No, I mean, I, I had it in blood out of you. Anyway. I was like, you know, is there anything on it I can do? And he said. Well, you could be this kind of tank commander who's also sort of the in charge of the military defending London. He's kind of the, the commander guy. Um, I mean, was really a tank commander, but you kind of embellished the role and made it sound really big. He, uh, so, well, was it was like, a... I'm in a tank. Oh, yeah, mate, I'm there. And the line that, that I love kind of the original War of the Worlds and that sort of thing, and I wondered yeah. that, that very British, Jesus Christ, fire, 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 you know. Yeah. Um, and you did it really well. I was really pleased. Please. It's me in the tank, and and I'll never forget it. We're on set, and I get in the the, the tank, and it's, it was the same as the Action Man Scorpion tank. If anyone ever used to own one, of them. <laughs> and the guy sitting in the tank, we, there's all these um, uh, blank firing shells for the for the tank all ready to go, and I think he's got one loaded up, and he's calmly sitting there smoking a massive roly. He's, he's rolling up, <laughs> and sort of lighting, and he he goes. Right, so listen, mate. If I say get the fuck out, you don't ask any questions. You just <laughs> jump out and you jump off the tank, right? That's the first thing he says to me when I get in, and I'm like, um, 
yeah, okay. <laughs> and and then I had to sort of in the dark find this firing pedal because I had to do my line and then drop down and fire the thing and then come back up again. There wasn't really any time to rehearse. First time I, I missed the pedal and uh, he was like, fucking idiot. And he fired it for me. <laughs> we did another one and I managed to hit it. It was uh, it was a lot of fun, but it was a bit, uh, no, it a bit intense. The, uh, the other thing was, you have to remember, we had tanks in central Birmingham. And if anyone knows, yeah. those of you know Birmingham, it's it's the uh, Victoria Square where the floozy and the jacuzzi is the big fountain with a statue in there. And and I, I, I really didn't want to use CGI. I mean, I don't know why. It was At the time, it was really important. It's got to be really, it's got to really fire. So we brought the tanks to the end and, and they fired them. And w when I was getting very excited with the tank guy saying we could do this, I thought about it. I thought, Christ. Well, and we're not really going to fire explosive, but so they put fireworks in the front, like just big bangs, basically. Yeah, but I was really bang. worried about the boom. I was worried about the boom breaking windows, so I had to go around the day before knocking on every shop window, shop saying, "Look, we're doing this thing on a Sunday night." Yeah, it was, but it was um, it worked out really well. But you know, the CGI all over the rest of the film, so I probably could have just CGI'd it. But it we, we should give a shout out to um, the lady who works for film birmingham who's fantastic i'm trying to cindy remember. campbell cindy yeah. campbell cindy campbell lovely cindy campbell yeah absolute uh, star i mean she, birmingham's double for london in films like spider-man and um uh kingsburn, uh, just, uh, kingsburn. they did um um ready player one was done just before right. we filmed yeah yeah but, um and, the, and the cindy is the person who makes all that happen and she works really hard she's brilliant but here's another thing right i i had i had to pay to, to to be there but it but right. they they did they did a really good deal but they kind of got into the whole crowdfunding thing and it wasn't i i mean i did have to pay the council i'm not and things like that but they they really got into the spirit of what i was doing and they everybody just rolled up their sleeves and did what they could to help you know and every every i mean i had loads of camera people with seven camera people there on uh on the day you were there on the tank day yeah that's how i ended and up directing second unit on it you for did. A bit. yeah you did thank and you for that. see he, he's worked for his that, that little yeah, check I, that I worked for that paycheck um, yeah it wasn't a big paycheck either but no. um, uh, uh, mate, i enjoyed every minute minute of it it was a lot no, of fun it was great it was great it was so great. great to be, be involved um, and uh it was, was no it was great but everybody got in the spirit of uh of of that whole you know that crowdfunding kind of thing and what I tried to do was take the audience, the crowdfunding audience with me on the journey. So everybody was invited to these things. And I thought, what well, I need to have more crowd scenes, you know, scenes with people in and just have people in the background as extras. And um, and it was it was great. And I tried to give everyone a credit as well. I mean, you look at there's a seven minute credit sequence at the end of the film. And um, I pretty much everyone that was there got a credit because I really wanted to, you know, bring everybody in on it as well. So it wasn't just, no, sure. uh, you know. Yeah, I'm very... Yeah. It's, it's, I'm yeah. very big on crediting absolutely everybody, including all the extras. Um, yeah. Or I just dash for a very quick break, uh, <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> bathroom break. Um, one of the things um, I, I wanted you to talk about, because obviously when, when you first engage with the crowdfunding platforms, and this will be important for, um, you know, young filmmakers yeah. that are watching and I, I know there's one in particular, uh, uh, Ollie, who's watching, who's going to start a crowdfunder, I think, next week. Yeah, um, I saw that. It, it, you know, it's changed a lot. I mean, cloud crowdfunding got very mm. saturated about five, six years ago. Even when I was doing it the second time, we had to work really hard to get people engaged and get on board. You go on and there, you know, 30, 40, 50 films a week on all of the platforms looking yeah. for people trying to make yours stand out and, and you wanted to reach people that weren't just your mates. That was the whole point. Um, what do you think are the challenges now and, and are they still viable? Do you think in your opinion, and, and, and there are some new ones as well. And are, are there any that are better than others? I mean, maybe just uh, while I dash off for a second. Okay. Well, you dash and I'll talk. Give us the benefits of your knowledge there from. Oh, moment. thank you. I've, V, do, do chip in if you if you, if you come up with anything. Okay, okay. Oh, well, thanks for that. We're going to have a nice week, and I'll just keep talking here. Okay, the thing for me, I think, I think, I don't think crowdfunding's changed, but I think social media has changed very significantly, uh, especially Facebook. Um, you know, there was a point when everybody was on there and everyone was doing it, and we all kind of communicated. But I don't know about you, but my feed now is is adverts is 
I don't know, it's just, it's stuff that I like, films and things, but I don't see so much of my friends on there, actually, and people that I used to know. Um, and it's it's more people trying to sell you stuff. Um, that's part of the problem. And I think everybody's got a little bit sick of crowdfunding. Absolutely, I, I completely agree. And um, I think, I think um, a lot of the problem is, so many poor people saw people like me doing it, thinking, oh, this is easy. We'll just ask people for money. And, and I didn't quite, I think, get the spirit of it. And um, you need to, you know, you've got to stop thinking of um, everybody out there is going to give you money. You're going to put your thing out there. And, every, and millions of people across the world, you don't know, go, uh, that don't know you are going to give you money. Well, it, it doesn't really work that like that in my experience. Crowdfunding starts with your family and your friends. And, you know, um, all my family put money in right at the start. All my family put money in. And then and then my friends, you know, and then it started to spread a bit wider. Um, but as soon as I didn't look after somebody or, or didn't reply or something, it would go against me. And what a lot of I saw a lot of filmmakers doing and I chipped into a lot of these campaigns. Yeah, um, me too. They'd never even they'd never write you. They'd never say thank you. You'd never get any updates. You wouldn't hear anything. There are about three or four people that I supported now that still email me and still message me and still you know they're on the journey and it's really encouraging but there are loads and loads and these some of these people really people that i know quite well just just didn't didn't work with the audience mm -hmm. yeah well it, it's what it's a it's a mega full-time job you're, you're you're um directing and you're also having to do all the the um you know the the the, the housekeeping of yeah, replying yeah. Emails which sometimes can take a half an hour in itself just to reply to one email in a meaningful way yeah so. absolutely I, I, I completely get it it's uh i mean luckily I'm, I'm being freelance um i did find myself putting a bit too much into it sometimes and neglecting my freelance work on on quite a few occasions and uh that sort of got me into a bit of trouble um certainly you know financially and stuff but um but it's it's just preparation is the key what I did, uh, on, on, if I remember rightly, a lot of these campaigns is I'd prepare, I'd have folders full of um, uh, pictures and articles and little bits written and I'd make all the videos up front and I'd say, right, I'm going to go on twice a day. I'll go on nine or eight o'clock in the morning for an hour, bang, come back four or five o'clock, bang, you know, and then maybe in the evening, you know, just sort of service it a bit and respond to people and that sort of thing. And I tried to be disciplined. I mean, there were times because obviously Lance and I, we know each other. Me and him were there all that long, bashing away to two o'clock, two o'clock in the morning. And I'm not a night person; he is. Um, but we'd be sort of like tweeting and Facebooking away, and it was, uh, yeah, that was a slog. It was a slog. You, I'm not saying remember, it was easy. You remember when you were up for that some sort of competition I, thing? I do. The most vote. And oh, I no, went no. everywhere on social you, media. You did amazing. Yeah, that was and, that was nonsense. Like when I look back at that, that it was all a bit nonsense, really. But it, I suppose it got it out there. That was the whole point. It was about. Well, you won because the, the other people cheated. They used the bot <laughs> to get a load of rubbish votes, and then the they the suddenly we we, yeah, we got thousands of. Um, I mean, it was we we were in it, the lead, and then suddenly they just made this massive they lead. Just and us. It was like, like, on. What was this? Uh, it was like I can't remember exactly. It was like a networking competition. You you had where there were a bunch of films. It was like, can you vote for my film? And it was an Australian company, and you do, and if the film wasn't made, or vote for our campaign. And the more people you got, the higher you got in the rankings. But but it shared it, and I think I think they might have given a, a, a donation of a hundred pounds to your campaign. I can't quite remember. It was remember. a bit. It was a bit more than that. I think it was about five hundred. No, it wasn't. No, I wish it was. No? Believe me, it wasn't 500. No, I think I mean, there was no, it wasn't. Benefit. There was another benefit apart from. I think it was. The, they were going to market. They were going to market you out there right. in your campaign, yeah. and it was. But it, that was when crowdfunding was quite exciting. There was a lot yeah, kind yeah, of going yeah. on, and yeah. but um, it's yeah, in the, in the days where you could get away with using bots. Somebody, yeah, I'd, yeah, we didn't have. Did. I don't know what bots like, they thought. They thought they did, um, and uh, um, just one. Question yeah. before I'm going to bring in our next guest, so we're going yeah, to have okay. a bit of overlap here, and it's going to be so lovely to um, for you guys to meet as well, um, because both you and Matthew Holmes, who's uh, in Australia, um, both had the premieres of your trailers at the premiere for my film. I, I remember it well, uh, and um, I decided every time I would have a premiere of a film, I was going to show a trailer of a friend of mine's film, at least one. 
uh, who was mate, who was in the process of either making their film or it was nearly complete. And you guys were both about halfway at that stage and were still doing crowdfunding campaigns. Matt did one more after that. And I think um, uh, you did a, quite a few more. Uh, so that was kind of nice to be able to give you that exposure. And they were, they were trailers just made from the footage that you, yeah, you that, had. Yeah, they cobbled so from, together. Mine was. From start to finish, how many campaigns and what was the total you raised? Me? Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, seven campaigns. I raised about 47,000, something like that. But that was over two years. It, right. And it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy. Um, I just noticed, actually, Sarah Pitts has just asked a question which is kind of, did, did I make more money from streaming than DVDs? Can I just answer that question? Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, the film's out now. Uh, streaming is is great. It's very lucrative, but it hasn't. No, I haven't really. We still we still haven't uh, done hugely well. It's, I, it's doing really well, actually. The Invasion Planet Earth we're talking about here, but it's a slow burn. I tell you, it's yeah. you think every time it's streamed, you, you it's you get micro pennies. I, if yeah, of it. not really even. Depressing. A fraction of a penny or something. It's well, I'm going to bring in our um, second yeah, okay. indie director guest tonight um, and meeting for the first time, not quite in person, but almost uh, Matthew and Simon. Uh, nice. Matthew Holmes. Hello. 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 Um, so Matthew can actually do a, be you can do a better Australian accent than you, Simon. <laughs> Sorry about the, my Australian accent. I... <laughs> That's all right. You came from a good place. I better be... I better do a better Australian accent than you, otherwise there's a problem. <laughs> yeah, nice to meet you. And you, and you. I heard a lot about you. Thanks, thank you. And um, yeah, um, so I'm, I'm jumping in. It's a bit early here in Australia, but um, so forgive me if my I'm not as sharp as normal. But um, yeah, um, let's. Yeah, I normally talk to you a bit later in the in the day, and you yeah, that's less right. <laughs> All right. I've got a, uh, I've got an extremely large cup of tea. So I'll, mm. I'll, uh, once that goes down, I'm sure I'll brighten up. Brilliant. So, well, before we um, uh, do a bit more and, and hear from both Matthew and Simon, what we're going to do is we're going to show the trailer um, for what would be Matthew's second feature film, right? The, yeah, Legend, of, the Legend of Ben Hall. Um, let's have a quick look at that, guys. I'm not underestimating this man, Sergeant. Out here, this is his world. I want you to take out a patrol. See where this leads. This may be our last chance. Come to see my son. He doesn't remember who you are, Benjamin. Come on, Ben. Two years we rode together. Two years, and they couldn't touch us. If we ride again, we do so for one purpose. To get enough to skip the country for good. Now I'm up for that. Suppose you're Ben Hall. I am, Lieutenant. My name is John Gilbert, and with me are my mates Ben Hall and John Dunn. Despite what the papers encourage you to imagine, this life you want is not easy. We do this because we have no recourse left. You know what their capture is worth? 2,500 pounds. Woo! We're worth more to our friends dead than we are alive. How long do you think we can last, Jack? If by the set date they have not surrendered, they will be declared outlaws. It means that anyone can kill you. Anyone. Run, get away from the country as fast as you can. To those here who crave to take our lives, have the courage to step forward and take it now. Go, now! You want a bloody fight? Come on! You want the whole country against us, Jack. Is that what you want? It already is! We're here to kill this man. So you had the chance, and you shoot him. I was right to leave you. Look what you've become. Nobody makes a move on him, fires a single shot, unless I do. We can take him alive, we will. Ben! Ah! You know what you're getting yourself into, lad. I'm game. 
Ah, fantastic stuff. Very good. Um, there's our man Callum, who's in The Walking Dead. Um, that's right. The end there. Uh, shortly after filming with us, he uh, he got himself a role on uh, The Walking Dead, which was just fantastic for him. Wow. Yeah. yeah. It looks like a really good, high quality movie. Huh? Wow. Oh, thank you. Well done. Well done. Looks like a proper film. <laughs> oh, come on, Simon. You're, you know, don't be hard on yourself. <laughs> um, I, I mean, so Matt, sort of tell us a bit about um, uh, how how the legend of Ben Hall started. I know I know, but our audience doesn't. And I know you've done a film, also a period film, feature film before that, that took forever to get made called Twin Rivers. But that wasn't crowdfunding because crowdfunding didn't exist then. No, um, no, you're absolutely right. <clears throat> Uh, well, look, yeah, as I said, crowdfunding didn't exist on my first film, so that all came out of my back pocket, which was about $30,000 over a six-year period. Um, that was some drama. Must be a big pair of jeans uh, to fit 30000 in, in a back pocket. That's a big <laughs> yeah. big pair of jeans. Believe me, it was not all at once. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, and then crowdfunding, I mean, I, my intention really was only to make it short, a short film about Ben Hall, 20-minute film. Uh, just to play, it really was just the last 20 pages of a great big feature film of Ben Hall that I'd made. I wanted to make the last 20 pages as a bit of a, I guess, a showreel of what the movie could be. And um, I thought, well, the only way I can pay for something so expensive is that because I needed guns, horses, costumes, the whole works, even just for this 20 minute short. I thought, well, I need to get some money. And I thought, well, the only way I can do it is crowdfunding. And I was curious to explore it. And, um, but it was going to cost me $75,000 Australian at least. And that's um, just for this 20 minute short, which I thought was pretty crazy to ask for. But I thought, well, I can't do it for any less. So I might as well just try it. So I did a lot of research on crowdfunding, the films that had successfully made it and the ones that hadn't, and um, designed the campaign as, you know, as good as I could. And ran it and fortunately I was enough to actually over finance and we actually raised about 130,000 Australian. So that yeah. gave us a chance to, well, we said, well, well, instead of 20 minutes, let's make it 40 minutes. You know, let's make something that potentially could run on a half hour TV slot or an hour TV slot or something. So we added a few more pages to the beginning and borrowed some scenes from this, from the feature film script and, and made it a bit of a longer thing and then headed out to start filming. And, um, we shot for three weeks and pretty much depleted our all our funds and we hadn't yet actually finished the short. We were still behind. We were still lacking uh, lacking scenes and so on and we were at a bit of a, a, a bit of a crossroad as to what we, on earth we were going to do with it and what on earth we were gonna, how we were going to finish the film. So, uh, yeah. yeah, the decision what we did. Hit, well, the crossroad was um, my producer... My producer was saying, why don't we just keep going? Let's raise some more money and make this a feature. You've already shot at least 30 minutes of this film. If not, you haven't got your full 40 yet, but you've. Um, let's just keep going because the footage was looking really exciting, even though the, those three weeks of filming was an absolute nightmare. Like That was a killer. <laughs> yeah, and okay. um, we, we literally had bitten off more than we could chew. And... I was like, well, my Ben Hall feature, the one that I've been planning for the last decade, is a big $30 million epic. It's not a crowdfunded little short like, or even a crowdfunded feature. I need my $30 million to make this. And uh, they said, no, let's let, we should really keep trying. And so I found a way to make the film a lot cheaper by con not condensing the story but rather only looking at a certain chapter of Ben Hall's life rather than looking at his entire life, which is what the original feature script was. Right. And um, thought that could maybe be done for a, <clears throat> like maybe a million bucks, maybe. And um, uh, and what had happened is after the shooting, the, like I said, I didn't have a complete film. Um, but I could, I had enough footage to cut together a trailer that was impressive. And uh, Ronnie Minder, the guy who did my music, he puts he put on some made some beautiful music for this trailer. And based on just that trailer alone, uh, I started getting all this interest from in within the, like, the Australian film industry and people I've been working with who all started saying, "Yes, this looks like a feature film. 
a big feature film. You should just keep going. Um, don't worry about finishing the short. Make this the feature. So with all that sort of pressure on me, it was and 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 people saying yes, let's do it, let's do it. Um, plus interest in the marketplace as well, based on that trailer. Uh, it was okay. Let's let's take the plunge and and um, try to make it a, a feature film. Um, we, however, to do that, we couldn't return to crowdfunding because we knew we wouldn't be able to raise enough. We did do another campaign to try to help, but it didn't raise anywhere near the amount of, as before. We had to go to private investment, um, things like that, and use some government tax incentives here in Australia to finish off the, um, to actually raise enough money to shoot the other, you know, hour and a half of the movie because the movie ended up being two hours and 20 minutes long. So we basically had to go and f find the money for another, you know, another two hours worth of, of filming. So, yeah, so that's how we did it. Um, but it was certainly the, the crowdfunding campaign that made it all was was the trigger for all of it because without that it would never, ever have gotten financed without us having that right. footage and having that trailer and um, actually showing people the vision first because as soon as people could see it, then they were interested. But I had, you know, I'd taken my Ben Hall script and ideas and storyboards around and everyone told me I'd never make it for my second film. They told me there was no interest in this sort of thing. And um, but when I bought the when I showed them the trailer and the power of the music and the images and all that, that's when people were like, OK, I get it now. And that's what that's what uh, and, the, and the crowdfunding campaign gave us that opportunity. What, what uh, percentage of the budget? in the end was crowdfunded as opposed to then I think you got some from a distributor distributor and yeah in the end I guess it probably would have been maybe or it probably would have made up about 10 percent of our budget if you look at the oh. whole yeah it would oh. have only really been a maximum of 10 percent of our budget once you um mm. yeah because we had to get um yeah we got a distribution deal uh, a number of pre-sales on the film um private investment we had a, a big private investor that really that really helped us who and that and the other thing is the biggest private investor we had on the feature had um they had put in a very large amount of money in the in the kickstarter campaign there was a one of my rewards was a you get a, a executive producer credit for five thousand dollars and he had put that in and one of the one of the perks for having done that mean, means that you can turn up on set anytime you like and just uh, watch what we're doing and, you know. And this guy who did that, I expected that he would turn up one day, say hello, have a coffee, watch what was doing and then go home. He ended up turning up every single day. <laughs> oh, God. Because he was just so interested in the, pro in the process and just so happy to be involved. <clears throat> And so what happened was he just became good friends with everybody and really good friends with us. And then he started watching what we were doing and he started getting really passionate about what we were doing and really excited. So when he saw what the trailer and then he heard about us making the feature, he wanted it to happen so much, he just dug deeper into his pocket because he'd become emotionally invested. Right, and, he turned, yeah. and he's ended up being one of my closest friends. That, so that could have gone so dangerously wrong but turned out to be such a good bit of fortune oh it could have gone dangerously wrong yeah. um, it could have who knows who would have turned up but yeah, yeah. that's another thing the crowdfunding campaign afforded us that uh, gave us the uh, gave us our largest private investor of the feature so yeah um, jump in simon you were going to say something no i was just going to say I, I completely relate to that um you know a lot of people saw me on on crowdfunding and and came in but one guy basically paid for this scene we shot in birmingham um, and then um, he, he came along with his family. It's such a great time. We had this conversation. Oh, I, when are you going to finish this film? I said, oh, I don't know. I'm working on it. He said, how much do you need? So I, I went away and did the maths. And he ended up pretty much funding the whole thing as well, right at, to wow. the end. It was amazing. And uh, he's become a friend as well. And, you know, that's the thing is we tend to think, you know, investors are these kind of mysterious people. But actually they're human beings with ambitions and dreams just like the rest of us. Um, exactly. It's, you know, no, that's so exactly I, I relate right. completely. And so, I think there's something about getting people emotionally in, because when you're when when you're just this unknown filmmaker over there and then they're an unknown investor over there, 
there's no connection. There's no – they can't put any kind of trust or in anything in, in what you're doing because they don't know you and you don't know them. Um, but we were able to build this bridge using Kickstarter. And then all they need to do is spend a few days with you. They get to know you and they start to, you know, and like I said, you build the trust and suddenly now, you know, they're emotionally invested in what you're doing. They now see you as a human and not as some idea of a human. Hmm. And, yeah, and suddenly those those uh, opportunities can, can blossom. I mean, I think that's one of the hardest things about raising money. Like I've been trying to raise money for other films since. And one of the hardest things to to raise money for films is just trying to get these people who've got the money and in one sense are willing to invest it, but because they don't know you, you can't, they, 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 they just never quite sign that check and yeah. you, go, you know, have yeah. yeah. any reason to. And, and it's, it's all about business plans and cash flow forecasts and sales. Mm. And, and actually when you sit down in the room together and have a man to man conversation or, or man to woman conversation, it's uh it's fantastic. You know, that that's when the magic happens. So um, exactly. it's hard, that's, isn't it? It's hard. It's very hard to get into that room. It's very hard to get into that room with someone. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you know, in my case, the, this guy turned up and because he had put $5,000 in and, and, um, and he was coming, I told my, my first AD, I said, when he turned up in this rather expensive looking car, um, I said to him, right, I want you to go and tell everybody on the set to treat him well. Everyone treats him well. Like, you know, say hello, say goodbye, get him a coffee, just treat him like royalty while he's here, you know. And, um, yeah, and I think that that just that respect and, uh, and, and letting him in on what we were doing and talking to him about what we're doing, and he just saw our passion. And he um and just and just become such good friends with everybody that when the idea that the film could go further, he just, he was as excited as everybody else because he was part of the team, you know. Yeah. And I think that's the that's the key: getting people emotionally hooked on your idea. Yeah. yeah. Just want to and, bring in a question uh, we yep. can ask from uh, Priyanka Aria. I hope I'm saying that right. <clears throat> and I'm going to prefix it with a couple of things because. You just said you, you, you've done a couple of crowdfunding campaigns since, and I remember one which I helped push was uh, that you were trying to make the, your version of the Ned Kelly story. Yes. Which I'm sure would have been the best version, or most accurate anyway. And I, I know that period of history is something you're very passionate about. But that that crowdfunder didn't quite succeed. I know it was quite an ambitious amount. Now, Priya's asking... Do you have a pitch formula that you feel is successful for crowdfunding in today's climate? And I guess that's a question for all of us. My answer to that question before I turn to the guests is it, we already knew that crowdfunding was oversaturated when we were doing our last crowdfunding campaign. And this is in, I think, 2014 it was. So in the lead up to that, we went online and looked at other crowdfunding campaigns and we promoted them. Uh, we, we, we went and found crowdfunding campaigns that we thought were interesting, that we thought we would, we would like to support. We didn't put money in all of them because we couldn't afford to do that. Mm. I did put money in Matthews, and that's how Matthew and I met. But through that, I met a massive network of other filmmakers. I'm still in touch with a lot of them now. Uh, but I, I was putting out before I asked for something. Mm. And I didn't expect them to um, put money into my campaign because I knew that they were all indie filmmakers who probably didn't have a lot of money. But I did ask them all to share my campaign. And I think and we, and we promoted 50, 50 filmmakers over a period of about six months. And um, and I think 48 of them uh, plugged our, our um, crowdfunder. Um, there was only two that didn't one of whom was an Australian not you Matthew that crazy <laughs> I told you about and um uh yeah and and through that we got a lot of love so my message to people who are doing crowdfunding now um is before you ask for something look at your own social media and ask yourself have I in the last five years plugged the work of anybody else if the answer to that question is no You've never shared a campaign of someone else. You, you've never promoted the work of a friend of yours. You've never put up a poster for a friend's play or a friend's film or whatever. How are you going to expect your circle of friends to do that for you? Uh, so that's 
that's my message um, of, of what you should be doing now. Um, but it is a very oversaturated market. So, Matthew, um, what should people be doing in the present market? You first and then Simon. Same question. Sure. OK, <clears throat> well, just to answer your first question, the Ned Kelly campaign uh, was was a big roll of the dice. I was trying to raise a couple of million. Mm. And um, hoping that the that the popularity of Ned Kelly here in Australia it would spread, um, but it was also because there was a rate it was a race a bit of a desperate race because if we knew there was another Ned Kelly film that was potentially going to be produced, and so this was just a bit of a mad gamble to go can we get ahead of them and just you know and just make this version and sort of blow this out of the water before it, before they get off, but. Um, uh, but we did actually raise, we still raised $120,000. Wow. So it may not have got the $2 million. So by one set of standards, it was still um, completely unsuccessful. But in terms of raising money, even though we didn't end up getting it because it was an all or nothing campaign, we still got to 120000 which was the same, wow. almost the same as Ben Hall again. Um. But so we were doing something right, but we were just trying to get more money out of the crowdfunding campaign than that was actually possible without having a massive fan base, like um, like like a worldwide gigantic fan base. Without that, you, you don't have much chance of raising it much more than that, I don't think. Um, so that's what happened there. I think... I think I agree with you, Lance, that, you know, finding people that you share that will be willing to share your campaign is, is vital. Well, remember, I did this, my Ben Hall campaign in 2014. So that's how many years ago now? Social media has changed a lot and the mm. algorithm changed a lot. Facebook has changed a lot. Back when I was running the campaign, Facebook didn't hide Kickstarter campaigns from people's feeds. Now it does. Now it knows you're running a campaign. It click, clicks onto it pretty quick and it hides it from all your friends and followers and everybody. It hides it until you start paying for ads. Because when I was, when I've run Kickstarter campaigns since, no one sees them. No yeah. one even knows they're on. And so, oh, is that, yep, yeah, I'm, I'm with you there. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, that's, 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 that's a biggest, really good point. Really good point. So, you're going to have to, Back when I was running the campaigns, I could rely on the on Facebook reach. It was just a wonderful little period of time. Yeah. Now, if I ran a Kickstarter campaign, I couldn't do it like that. I wouldn't. I couldn't rely on that. So, and this is which leads into my next uh, point for the person who asked the question. Um, I think there's a one crucial thing that I see when people run crowdfunding campaigns, and I see a lot of them for, for short films and features and whatnot, and I usually go and click on them to have a look what they're doing. And I can tell you 9.7 times out of 10, they're doing it wrong. And this is what this is the fundamental reason they're doing it wrong and the fundamental reason why most campaigns fail is because they're not treating their film, their product, like a product. They're treating it like a charity. Please help me make the film. Uh, this is my passion. This is me and my team's dream. Uh, help us out. You know, do something good for us. You know, it's charity based. And it's like this, um, they're asking people with this kind of attitude. And this will get you your friends, your followers, and maybe a few people along the way who will help you and give you a, a few bucks. But it's never going to give you the the big the big campaign. It's never going to give you a large amount of money. You'll you only raise a few thousand that way every time. And, and if you go in with that approach, you're doomed to fail, I think. Uh, I think the only way to approach a Kickstarter campaign, which is what we did with both Ben Hall and Ned Kelly, which was we didn't treat it like a charity. We treated this like a business proposal. We've got an awesome product. We know it's awesome. We're telling you how awesome it is, and you're going to want this film. So if you want this film, you better put up for it. And that's sort of the attitude you've got to have, um, which is just selling a product, you know, and you've got to make it, you've got to have a product that people want. 
jazz it up and sell it to them. So when they finish watching your promotional video, you're not begging for their money or begging for help. It is them going, wow, holy shit, that film looks so good. I have to see that. I really want that to happen. Now I'm going to put a few bucks on it because I want that to happen. And because I really want it to happen, I want to share it with other people. So they put into it so it will happen because I, I really want this to happen. So you end up getting a little army of people that want this film to become a reality because they're mm. so passionate about it because you've sold them on it. And I think that's the big key that every Kickstarter person needs to bring, take in. That attitude has to be full, at the front. So that's yeah. my advice. Simon. Wow. Looking well, at that, Simon. Whoa. Well, well, that, that was very good. I, I mean, um, I, oh, oh, okay, okay. I had this great thought of what I was going to say, and that's kind of like blown me away a little bit. Um, I, I've always found, as regards the actual pitch video, which is what your question was about, um, I've always found be genuine, be interesting, uh, be be passionate and, and really care about what you're doing. But in the same way that you just said what you said, Matthew, I think um, I, I look at it like, look, this film's happening, whether you're on board or not. And it's going to be fantastic. And, you know, if you want to get on board, now's the time because you won't be able to soon. And I, I try and pitch it like that, but as genuinely as possible. And um, people, I mean, in the same way, I think people saw what I was doing on my my previous film, Invasion Planet Earth, or Kaleidoscope Man. And they were going, this, this looks amazing. We've got to have part of this. And, and everybody was sort of jumping in. And I, I really relate to what you were saying about um, the Kickstarter um, the way they've changed it, I didn't realize that they they know what, you know about crowdfunders and stop showing them to people. But I know certainly whenever I put stuff out, a select group see it, and it doesn't go beyond that. And that's yeah. it's a shame because you, you my business um, page on on um, uh, um, what's it called Facebook. Facebook. Um, it's it's like it's dead. I put it out, and like you say, it's all about money. You you throw money at it, then they'll advertise it for you. But I always get annoyed when I see anything you know that says sponsored on it because that's really bloody annoying that facebook do that but i understand yeah. they've got to do it because that's the law um but it really uh it, it really it's crushed it so i tend to do the majority of my crowdfunding now on twitter and linkedin actually linkedin's been very very um helpful but but uh, but you come you come at it more, more professionally in a similar way that you were saying and i try to do that um another thing i've done Sorry. Sorry. You... What about Instagram? Is Instagram um, a little bit? I not me personally. I think I think a lot of people do. I I've had too many. I, I'm losing the will to live. Three three is enough. I can't take any more. And let's not do TikTok. <laughs> right. No. Um, <laughs> we had that uh, conversation uh, before we got online. Oh really? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, but yeah, but yeah. Go, going back to the pitch video, I think people want to know a little bit about you, um, a little bit about the the project, but they want to see that. You're genuine, you're passionate, and it's a real thing. And that and that whatever you offer, you're going to deliver. Because this is where mm. a lot of people have blown it, uh, crowdfunding. They just don't, you know, they make all these promises and then they don't deliver. And then nobody knows, well, did yeah. the film ever get finished? What, what was it? I'm sure I yeah. put some money into that. And yeah, you know, that's, that's, that's killed yeah. it for independent filmmakers. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we, we did a crowdfunder for Paratrooper, which you guys, you know, know a little bit about, and and that was for a pilot, and um, I'm, we're still chasing money for it now. Um, uh, I've often been asked, and I said I'd touch on this, so I'll cover it now quickly. Um, why we didn't crowdfund Pegasus Bridge, which was the film I was working on before Paratrooper? Well, that had a budget, needed a budget of. Um, six it was originally budgeted at six million um then we realized that the uh um uh, certain parties were going to take quite a big chunk of the budget supposedly for raising it so the budget got put up to nine million um and whether it was six or whether it was nine but by the time we were working on that which was end of 2015 there was no way even for a world war ii film with a core fan base that was really wanted that film um it was no way we were going to raise even a million quid mm -hmm. um I, I and that Very was not nice. um, i crowdfunded my people say you should only crowdfund a feature film once in your career um simon's pushing that barrier now 
But um, and I, I don't think that's necessarily completely true. But I had just done the crowdfunder with the journey, and I, I wanted to do, you know, I wanted the cast that I wanted. I, I, most of those actors ended up in Dunkirk, which was very annoying. And um, but so that was the reason we we didn't go that route for exactly the things you've been touching on. There's no way we would have raised that money. Um, Paratrooper had a much smaller budget because it was a pilot for a TV show. We budgeted it about two fifty because we, we it had it was much more contained. Um, and I thought maybe we might be able to raise maybe around a hundred thousand because we'd be dipping into the same core fan base, but there was a lot less to raise. <clears throat> By the time we did the crowdfunder for, for Paratrooper, the the um, crowdfunding platforms were completely saturated. Mm. And we, we raised, I think, about ten or 12,000, which we got, got about nine and a half to spend on our trailer and second unit. And obviously, obviously some people paid for, um, you know, a digital copy of the film when it's available. That perk yeah. we haven't been able to fulfill because we don't have a completed film yet. And... My apologies to those people, but we did have a big clause about that, that you know. Um, and it's frustrating because we've shot a load of footage, but we still don't have a completed oh. movie. And we, I, I don't believe if we went back to try and crowdfund the balance, I don't think we'd get it um, in, yeah, in today's yeah. market. Um, it's, it's very, very difficult. Yeah. Uh, you mean I was, facing a sim I was facing down the barrel of a similar problem when we... Like I said, I'd shot my three weeks and I didn't have a film in the can. And I didn't actually have any money for post-production left over either. Like, it was, it was, I didn't know how I was going to finish. And so I was really looking. It was sort of one of those things for me was that do we try to crawl? It's like, you know, we did the campaign. We've shot the footage. We've spent the money. We're in the crevice. Do we climb our way out of the crevice or we just go deeper and hope that we can find our way out if we keep going down deeper? And yeah. uh, we should be deeper and um, with, with Ben Hall. And fortunately, you know, came out the bottom safe and sound. But And we're able to, to, to deliver everything. But, yeah, that's one of the big things is with, you I know, mean, people think crowdfunding, great free money. And, well, it's not free money in a, in a way. It's no, you, that's you, not, you yeah. have a responsibility to all the people who have, you have a responsibility to finish to all the people that have put in and to deliver whatever promises you've set out. Um, you know, if people know the risks and you've got to tell them the risks and if they are willing to take the risk, great. But if you've told them it's a definite thing, then you better make sure you, you finish and those who haven't have just sort of soured the platform. Yeah. And you're right, it is oversaturated. There's too many people doing it and there's not enough people doing it well, you know. Um, no, I think very frustrating. Go on, Simon, jump in. The, the reality about making feature films is... First of all, they're really hard. And uh, secondly, however creative you are, they're still expensive. You know, and it's if you want to pay actors and pay your crew minimum wage, it adds up. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. And people, people get really, they start down the road and they go, oh, my God, I, how the hell are we going to do this? Um, and I've seen that a few times. And I've, yeah. I've been there, you know. it's it's, it's I, There was a point on um, Kaleidoscope Man when I just thought, how the hell am I going to finish this? I promised to these thousands of people that put money in, um, how am I going to do this? And I just think the only way is just to keep going and, like you say, get deeper and deeper and deeper. But eventually, suddenly there's light at the end of the tunnel when you, you get to the end of the film. Then there's the nightmare of distributing it. And, you know, I'm just reading uh, Gary Bolter had written a question there, Lance. Sorry to... Yeah, no, I'll, we'll, we'll come to that. I've got it. I've okay. Got it. Don't, worry. But, Don't worry, Gary. We'll get to that in a sec. I think, you know... Um, it's a lot of distribution has a lot to do with the fact that it's really, really hard for any of us independent filmmakers to get to get on the ladder and to get films and to get success. So yeah. the thing I like about crowdfunding is as ever as hard as it is, it's real. You get real money in your bank account to make your film. And whether that whether that's in my case to do one special effects shot. Or, or to get some models, spaceship models made for the new film, or maybe to shoot for a couple of days. It's real. I, I, I have I, over the years, I've had conversation after conversation where, oh, you, we give you two hundred for that. You get, oh, that's you get a million for that. You, you know, and you hear all these big figures banded around. Yeah. <laughs> and at the end of the day, you come home, you can't afford a bottle of milk. And uh, so, so mm. the reality, crowdfunding is real, and it's hard, but it's real money. That's why I like it. 
I don't want to keep doing it, by the way. No, I, investors listening. <laughs> I mean, so I know you, you, you. I've got a couple of questions I want to ask you both before we lose Simon, who's got to tuck his kids in bed or something. But um, uh, no, they're eighteen and sixteen. Oh, are they? Seventeen. Yeah. So you've only got, you've only got to read them the story then. You yeah, they put me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They've been um, in. No, but but one of the you're both you've both got films on the go now. Um, Matt's just about to wrap his next feature, which yep, we'll, just, we will. We, yeah, just yeah, wrapping we'll, that up. We'll get into that a bit more um, a bit later, Matt. Um, uh, Simon is at it again with uh, of Infinite Worlds, of which I read a very early draft of uh, a very early script. Very different um, now. Yeah, it's very different now. Um, he, he took my 200 notes on board. Um, <laughs> <Pretty yeah. bit. laughs> uh, well, we're just about to have that conversation when you say, oh, I've completely rewritten it already. Um, so, I mean, this ties into Gary's question, which is an interesting one. You know, you've both had features that have been released. Um, do you find it easier to get through the door, so to speak, and speak to the, the money people, whoever they are, um, or is it is it just as hard? Um, Simon, you want to go first on that one? Um, yeah, I, well, okay, I'm going to be really blunt here. The reality comes down is, did your investors make their money back? Or did they make a return on their investment? And my case, they've done all right. They've done a bit, but they haven't made the full money back yet. These are, and I'm not talking the crowdfunding. I'm talking the... the no, yeah, the, the private investors. And, and, and so right at the moment, nobody's too keen to jump back in. The guys are paid back, the small investors, or the, the loans. We had loans and, and, and equity investment. The loans have been paid back, and some of those guys have come back in. And it's been amazing. Um, but that's, that's, that's where the problem comes to me. I can, get it, I can get into most places now. It, it does help. But I've kind of given up on the film industry. I just think, I'm just sorry, the British film industry, I, I struggle with it. I'm, I, I guess, I don't know what they see me as, but they don't even see me, but I find it very hard to get in the door and talk uh, to these guys. So um, that's that might be my problem, though, not necessarily theirs. Oh, Matt, it's lucky that the Australian film industry is so supportive of independent filmmakers. <laughs> you tell us about right. your experience. Oh, 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 oh. Get, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, I mean, I was fortunate enough that my... Um, my film paid back its investors, yeah, um, but that's pretty much all it did. So no one walked away at a loss, but no one walked away at a at a um, that's, you know with a with a large amount of money. money back, that's you know? great. That's great. Um, but um, the good thing is that the people who had put it in, they didn't put it in thinking, "Here's my chance to get rich." They were just passionate about the idea, and they knew there was a possibility they weren't going to see it again. The fact they got it back. Um, even without a cherry on top, but they got their money back. They were like, okay, that was a fun thing to do. And I'm glad I did it. But, you know, they, and I've been able to go back to them since for a little bit of money, but nowhere near the level of investment that they were putting in before. But I was able to go back for my second film and say, hey, I'm making this much smaller film. And because I got those established relationships now, they were willing to go, yeah, I'll put in a few, I'll put in a few thousand, you know. Yeah. It wasn't hundreds of thousands like before, but because they were, they you know, they knew they'll probably get that that few hundred back, those few thousands back. They're willing to do it again. So, ha having done it, yes, it does help you get through the door to a degree. But having done Ben Hall, does it does it make people fall over and you know swing open the doors to investors and you know for my for my two three million dollar movies? No, nah, not really. It doesn't really. It's still very, very hard to get anyone to part with their money uh, in, in in a private investment sort of sense, even with Ben Hall done. So and, and the, the support from, I guess, is it called the Australian Film Commission? We've had conversations about this. I know for independent filmmakers such as yourself, is it fair to say it's not really there? Well. It's not there for a number. I don't think it's there. The problem is you're talking about a very small well and a lot of thirsty people. Mm. So every per every filmmaker, whether it's Baz Luhrmann all the way down to the 17-year-old the who's walked out of school and wants to be a filmmaker, you've got everyone in that 
spectrum in Australia, all zeroing in on the pitiful amounts of money that the Australian Film Commission and every other state has their own one as well. And these they don't have much money to give. Everyone wants it. And they're all for certain programs and your film has to fit the program, you know, and it might just be a bit of script development money or it might just be a little bit of, you know, and nowhere is there a place where you can just go and get, um, you know, a huge swag of money to go make a feature. You, they just don't give it out. And if there is that, they're only going to give it to the people like the Baz Luhrmann's and the people that are established. Yeah, it's the film bank. Everybody, a lot of people come to me and say, why don't you just go to Netflix? Why don't you just do this? <laughs> don't realize like, it's that easy. Yeah. yeah. Like, oh, sure. I'll just yeah, get Disney no, a call. You, you, can, you can't get in front of those people. Like, no, you, you can't. No contact them. There's no phone number. There's no email. And if you find it, they'll just send you away. You know, yeah. you have unless you've got an established it. relationship, it's, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the only be way I've been able to. The only way I have been able to contact places like Netflix to pitch the TV series that I've developed and things like that, um, to even just get my pitch book in front of them, the only way was my producer had to find a lawyer who knows them and has a relationship and pay the lawyer to take it to them. Wow. So you've got to put in thousands of dollars to pay someone else just to put a pitch book under their nose. And uh, look at before we hear from v, v on this, who's a producer, so it'd be great to hear her thoughts. Um, I just want to put a word of warning to those people watching this. There's a proper racket that exists now with kind of middlemen saying, pay me X and I'll get this to the, the important person at Netflix or Amazon or Apple or whatever. You'd better make sure that you've got, a thorough background check of like CSI Miami proportions on that mm -hmm. individual about exactly what their connections are, what their track record is of getting projects in front of people, who, what relationships they have, what is their background, what is their experience? Because 99% of those people are talking absolute ha 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 ha. And you know, um, can I just yes. chip, can Simon I chip in? in? Okay. Okay. I'll tell you a story now about very quickly. Um, Let me the loo while you're doing before, before, before um, uh, we, we started crowdfunding, uh, probably about 2008, a Canadian came to me and said, I, I can get you the money, two and a half thousand dollars. I thought, oh, God, I spoke to my lawyer about it. He said, oh, don't do it. But I thought, what the hell? What, what can happen? He was talking about five hundred thousand dollars. So I thought, well, it might be worth a gamble. Paid the money. Never saw it. But then then it all it, it, it made it the whole thing collapsed me and I, I got into a right mess financially so um yeah beware these guys they're uh these bloody horrible people that don't have anything yeah. to do are you talking a literal comedian a comedian or you're just saying like a, like a joker like some a muppet comedian oh what who did i, I say comedian a comedian came to you as i obviously missed oh him. no 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 did i say comedian no no um um no, an investor, it came via an investor pool, actually. So oh, okay. he came from somebody that was genuinely, he'd been conned. And this guy came and he mm. spoke to us on, we, we had a, uh, a call. It was before Zoom and all that sort of thing. We had a, we had a phone call between us. He was putting money in. He was going to do this. He'd connect universally and all this. And so I thought, well, it's worth, what the hell? I'm, I'm in deep enough as it is. It's that thing where you get, keep going deeper into the hole. No, and I nearly, nearly got into serious, serious debt because of that wow yeah, that's good. and of course that's he's good. just a charlatan yeah he just he just disappeared no so what i chased him he just vanished simon is this an individual that owns an interesting van with lots of logos on the side i think it might do yeah he was canadian as well not there's any i love canadians but that that, made, that was what made it so impressive as well the fact that he was connected with all the studios in canada and ah, oh, just anyway you want to say his name I mean, since he is a, a fraud, I can't so. ask you. I can't actually remember his name. I, I, it was twenty years ago, not quite. It was eighteen years ago, something like that. So I've forgotten. Do you, do you keep your emails? Probably. I'll have to. God, yeah. Well, seriously, I'll have to interrogate you about this. That was off the cuff. I can. Uh, he's probably retired now. He was old. He was quite an old chap. So uh, he's probably gone. Well, somewhere. I mean, with a bit of luck, he might be dead. Well, you know, then you know. Be on anybody else. Well, I wouldn't want to wish that on anybody, but uh, it was. It was, it was it really just it just broke my heart if I'm really getting all emotional about it because uh it was I was struggling to 
to do this thing and i've raised a lot of money and i needed that last chunk and it was yeah. it was the chunk that did it but anyway and i told my other investors about it they they uh got excited about it and then he disappeared and it just all just collapsed and suddenly you're like bloody hell i've just spent years putting this thing together and um it's just collapsed again because of yeah. life people getting really enthusiastic and not being able to deliver what they promise and it happened to me year year no sorry just over a year ago i gotta be careful what i say here an investor promised a lot of money and it, it was he, he had other filmmakers there and he didn't deliver i knew i just knew it. I, I was experienced at that point but the other filmmakers got quite damaged by it as well so there's a lot of people out there just promising the earth and they're just nonsense yeah, yeah. and then disappearing um, yeah. take, hey, let, let's bring you in here because you sure. worked as a producer let's be positive sorry bring it up a bit case. well i think it's good to alert potential <clears throat> filmmakers of, of the dangers of these things because you know yeah. you don't want it to happen to somebody else like yourself but um but the, yeah, uh, you know as a producer's perspective how, do you think it's easier now or uh, to raise money privately or, or through traditional channels or is it even harder these days oh, it's it's really very very hard even when you've got lots of talent involved um just before lockdown um i was um well still am but way into doing this uh, documentary that had the working title um thatcher the tracks of her years which was about the <laughs> it's uh yeah it's uh, the, the the music uh that uh, margaret thatcher um inspired mostly protest songs a hundred odd protest songs she's had the most protest songs written about her um than any other premier in the world um wow. and then uh a lovely brilliant man called bob smeaton who's um the like the creme de la creme of uh, music documentary filmmaking. He's won, I think, two Grammys. He's one of um, two people, uh, documentary filmmakers, to win Grammys for their music documentaries. He's done like um, two Beatles um, uh, anthologies, I believe. Um, I might be, um, I might be giving him a disservice, but he's, he's proper good. He hated the title Thatcher, the tracks of her years. He's from Newcastle, um, and and all the things that were entailed in it in Newcastle. So he's like, this is. I'm not even going to try and do a Geordie accent this time. <laughs> uh, he kept on saying, I will not have that, you know, that title. Um, so we've ad we've adapted it now, but then obviously COVID um, came in. There were so many people saying, yes, we'll definitely put something in. Um, if you get somebody else to put 60% in. So everybody, <laughs> oh yeah, I'll do it, but that one. it's the hit. And yeah. you know, lots of great talent in there um, from from um, Bob, the director, um, and uh, a lovely guy called Anthony Thomas, um, who's done a lot of stuff on um, on BBC and Channel 4, and um, got uh, the wonderful Billy Bragg, um, uh, to appear um, in it and uh, shot a shot a teaser. We got um, uh, Jerry Dammers. I think Jerry Dammers was the first person to come on board, right. um, and uh, Junior Giscombe uh, to come on, on as well. It took so long trying to get some money out people um, that we've had we had to at least two interviewees die on us um, during this. So, oh, man. Um, wow. but, did you get uh, them on camera first? No, unfortunately, no, because oh, when, when you get the, uh, the message of like, they're not feeling very well right now, right. You're not, you, know, um, you know, they'll they'll just have a, you know, dedicated to at the end. But it, it might seem odd that we started just before, um, just before lockdown and then we're dedicating film to them, you know, at the end of 2022. But um yeah. So it's it's now taken on a, a, a bigger scope. You, you hear a lot of these, um, um, a lot of the, the, the investors say that they want to have um, an international appeal, and international for that you read American. You know that anything American is, is so it's it's helped um, push us in the right way um, as much um, as instead of just making it about Thatcher, which Bob wasn't particularly happy with because it had her name in the title, even though. I thought it was a really clever title, sort of play on words. Um, that to the transfer years. Um, it's now called. Uh, it's now encompassing um, the story of Ronald Reagan and um, and Thatcher as well. So it's the ballad of um, Maggie and Ronnie. 
Okay. That's, that's not bad. Okay. That's yeah. yeah. Makes me think of spitting image. Uh, yeah, yeah. They, they had quite the, the love affair, and, and you know, there was loads of music that uh, that that inspired, and lots of music. Um, um, musical movements uh, being made uh, around about their, their tenures, but uh, obviously you've got to remember during the time of Ronald Ronald Reagan, it's uh, rap music, um, you know, versioned in a, in, a, in a big way. So, I mean, in summary then, you know, you've got a project which ticks a lot of boxes and kind of has a, I mean, it might be, some people might think it's a bit niche, but I, th I think that sort of documentary would have a, a, a natural interest, a pretty, an audience would definitely watch that. But still finding the funding, COVID or not, very How difficult. How much are you trying to raise, if don't mind me asking? Uh, do, if, don't ask if you do. No, um, I think it was four million. I'd have to look at the uh, the budget again. Um, For a documentary? Yes. Which... Music, the music clearances. Um, wow. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. all right. Fair enough. Wow, four million. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and yeah. you probably have to have parity parity on any interviewee because if they're all in the music industry, they'll all know each other. How much fee are you getting to take part in that documentary? Five thousand. Yeah, two and a half. So yeah. you'd have to have parity because otherwise that will cause you a big problem mm. as well. Um, wow. This yeah. Is it. yeah, yeah. Um, I want to. There's there's a couple of questions I want to ask while we've still got everybody. Um, and really sort of bringing this into the present and, and diverting slightly from crowdfunding now. There's a lot of changes going on in, in the film and um, television world, not just in terms of how products are getting made, but the quality of stuff that's being put out. And um, I think it's fair to say that there's a, there's a sense within the industry that there's a lot of... Um, uh, I'm trying to put this uh, diplomatically. There's there's a, there's a, there's a lot of um, themes being pushed on, and a lot of box ticking happening um, on on every shows. And sometimes that's a requirement for funding. Um, but I, I feel sometimes there are narratives that are thrust into shows that don't feel like they should be there. And I, I sort of am I watching a murder mystery here, or am, what is this about? Um, I could give an example of a recent BBC drama that I, I thought really suffered from that, but I won't. Um, I mean, um, I'm just interested to get thoughts from our guests. Um, uh, you know, do you feel that the, the quality from, let's say, the, 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 you know, the big players in the industry, Hollywood, the big studios and so on, has it remained consistent since the decades of the... 90s and the noughties to now or, or do you feel that there's a, a drop in quality we are of course seeing a lot of sequels a lot of remakes all of that kind of thing um and and we'll talk about star wars on television in a minute because i want to hear from simon about the book of <laughs> Boba Fett. uh but yeah just more general how do you what do you feel about the quality of the output today and have you noticed any trends uh matthew first uh look i think yeah there is definitely um a trend at the moment to put in a lot of, I don't know, themes or ideas that are popular now. Um, and then look, and, and I think that's, look, I think it's fine if you want to tell those stories and there's a place for those stories. Absolutely. You know, and in some cases they need to be told, but I don't think every story needs to be that. And some no. stories do not require this or to, and to, put them in is to shoehorn in. And I think that's where it bothers people. It's not that people, you know, don't think that these things are important, but if it's shoehorned into something where it doesn't belong, that's when people get upset and fan bases get upset. And I understand that and empathise with it. Um, I felt the, I have felt the, um, the, I, I don't know, the cattle prod of, in, 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 in on me, uh, when, when I've been writing other scripts that I want to take to market and things like that, you know, you get people saying, well, you should put this in it and you should put this in it. If you really want to get more that you should put it. And you're like, go away. That, I'm not putting that in. That's just, that is me pandering to um, a modern ideology or something. And that's not, that's not what this story is, but they try to push you to do that. And I've found that a little annoying. Um, and I think, uh, Mm, the big problem 
like I said, the output with the big studios now and the big streamers, which are basically replacing the big studios, um, what I find is there is absolutely a drop off in quality, not in quality of camera work, visual effects, and you know, movies are looking better than they've ever looked. But there is this, um, I think the, the basics of storytelling are being lost and abandoned. You know, the, the, the work on the screen, on the scripts and the stories and uh, is what's, is where the movies are suffering now. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's this, because there's such a push for content, um, scripts are being hurried and rushed into production. Just right, right, right. What do you, you got something great yet? Yeah, fund it, put some big actors in it, go content, content. There's not that labour of years of trying to make the best damn script you can and getting lots of input on it and finally after, you know, after many great brains have looked at this thing and finally created something fantastic. Um, I think the push for content pushes out a lot of a lot of crap. You know, haste has made waste and I think that's one of the big problems. And that's sometimes, my... sometimes there can be too many cooks, of course, on a script and that you can go the other way and that can dilute the... Absolutely, it just dilutes the vision. You know, you've got yeah. too many gifts in the kitchen. You know, and and whatever whatever was special and unique. Yeah, I mean, look if you look back at the eighties and the nineties, there were such strong voices in cinema. Like you just knew a Paul Verhoeven movie when you saw it, and you knew it was going to be a Paul Verhoeven movie. You know, it just everything about it. But where are the, a lot of these films now feel so generic? Like there's no voice behind it. It's all mm. they all feel like they're all part of the same thing, made by the same people. There's no unique voice or style or you know, it's very rare to find that. And I think that's a shame. Everything gets sort of is getting, I don't know, like factory made into all being the same. And uh, I find that's a, a, a troublesome thing. You Simon, look, your 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 thoughts. Uh, on the topic. Yeah, I, I can completely agree that the voices have been lost and films used to be magic. You know, you go and watch a Robert Zemeckis film and you, you just come out, you're beaming. And I mean, that might be nostalgia, but I think you could look at these old films now from, from those periods and they were, they were very uh, magic. You know, some of them had magic. I, I think about Superman. I know that's going to be in the seventies, but there was a film when you're cheering at the screen and you go yeah. and see some of the big Hollywood, uh, some of the big Marvel movies, like we saw the Spider-Man before Christmas. And I, I have to be honest, I thoroughly enjoyed it. It was the first one for a while I've gone, yeah, well, last. I think a lot of people really did but, rate that film. Yeah. Yeah, I thought, I mean, it was very, very enjoyable. And it, it ticked all the emotional boxes. That, I mean, I'm, spoiler alert, you know, there were there were characters in it that were just fantastic. But but there's something uh, something missing. And I, I completely agree. It. We, we, we lack the, the, the filmmaker that go, that makes the film. And yes, Spielberg did, um, um, what's the dance film? For musicals, just done. Uh, it's West Side Story. West Side Story, yeah. And I don't think people cared. I think people are so saturated with content. You know, you, you don't rush out to the cinema anymore and watch the Spielberg movie. And, and I, I would have done. I actually yeah, don't. Yeah. Um, I, I yeah. don't but it is I, a saturated market. It's, totally it's saturated. That, that's that's a problem, and, and all the individual voices have just become, you know, Netflix, and you know, and the series is everything I tend to watch feels dragged out, you know, over-explained, and it's like, where's the story, the excitement, the fun? Yeah. You know, um, and I, I'm sick and tired of watching Netflix series. I've seen a few of them where they're just so bloody bleak and realistic, and you just come mm. away and think, oh god. I sat yeah. through that. It was great. It had great potential. And it just, just, you want to, it's just, just disappointing. That's all yeah. I can say. And, and I think it's really important that us independent filmmakers, now I'm not saying we're going, I'm not saying I'm going to come and save the day, but I think it's really important that independent filmmakers are, are given a break and are able to make their product and get it out there. I really think it's important. Otherwise, we're going to just be a, we're just, here in the UK, we're just going to be a facility house for American yeah. productions. Yeah. Um, One thing. That, <clears throat> sorry, go oh, sorry, sorry, to interrupt. You you finish on. No, I've gone. I'm done. I've spent. Okay. <laughs> well, one of the one of the things that I wish I could grab a hold of these Hollywood executives and like grab them by the collar and shake them and scream in their face is, do you not know that every major IP that you are flogging and making sequel after sequel after reboot started as an independent film? 
an independent little idea that some brilliant filmmaker wanted to make and every studio said no to them. You know, Robocop um, and Star Wars and all these movies Blade have been tracked back yeah. at some point. No one wanted anything to do with it, but someone worked that idea and by hook or by crook made that film and then everyone was like, wow, that's amazing. it became become a hit and now they're going, right, let's make a franchise out of it. But they don't realise that those ideas don't come from uh, story groups in in, nope. in the Netflix. That they, no, they come from someone who has a passion and has a great idea. And so if you squash the independent world where these, that's the breeding ground of the next franchises in the independent filmmaker, in the passionate person, not in a think, a think tank of 26-year-olds who have, you know, luck no, Not life. lived. Yeah, and not lived and not oh. gotten into that rooms for some reason because their uncle got him a job at Netflix. It's not you've got to, you know, th these. Um, that's the fertile breeding ground of the of all the next I, great I movies agree. in the world. And if they squash it, and I think um, uh, before I turn to to V, uh, make sure she can get a word in edgeways. Sorry, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, one other thing I'd like to say about independent filmmakers, especially the those of us that have made one or two movies and all of us here have made two um, is that we become very skilled at making money going extremely long way. We've become very skilled at collecting assets uh, around us. I mean, I had world war two assets lined up to do both Pegasus and paratrooper for a fraction of the cost that they would have cost something like saving private Ryan or, or band of brothers. Um, you know, I would have made um, three million quid look like 30. And um, that's something that as an indie filmmaker, you become very skilled at. I mean, it would be to. great if Netflix set up some kind of initiative or Amazon. Maybe we can, Simon, you can edit this bit later and we can send it as a little sound. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go on. Make it. So, so if, if, if Amazon and Netflix could set up an initiative for real indie filmmakers who've got a track record of at least making one film that's semi-decent or they've had a good stab and and you know they give you a budget of half a mil to see what you can do because half a mil in the hands of a of an indie filmmaker who's trodden some dirt and been in the trenches is a lot of money to make a decent product and i could i could get uh, some really good quality actors on board with a budget like that and make a cracking little film Matt's making uh, a cracking one at the moment called The Cost, which I've actually seen. I've seen a, 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 a I would call it, call it less than a rough cut. It's a pretty close to finished cut. Um, and uh, it's a fantastic little film. We're, we're going to talk about that later. But, um, yeah, I just think Netflix and Amazon and Apple do an initiative like that because there's a lot of people out there who, if you do a bit of digging into them, into your applicants, you can see that they've done the graft give them a chance. And they're not all going to be 21, by the way. They're going to be people that have lived it a bit. And, and yeah, you know, right. you can see that all three of us here are getting grey hair. And, and can I, while we're on it, can I just talk about briefly about IMDb and about Amazon and about these stupid reviews that are just having such a damaging effect on independent films? When, when uh, you know, my film goes out, it goes out next to all the big Hollywood movies and people know nothing. They don't know what a micro-budget movie that spent 10 years and it's crafted means. And then they just crap all over it. And it's it's hugely damages the morale and crushes the passion of these really talented filmmakers. I can think right now of about 30 independent filmmakers that I know from Twitter and Facebook and that I know personally that if they were given the opportunity um, to, to well, on a budget of say like you say 500,000 from from Netflix or something like that could make a fantastic film original inspired and and that could spawn off loads of sequels I'm sure if they yeah. wanted to do that but but you've got to we've got to get rid of IMDB or get rid of the get letting the idiots in to review films and I'm I'm not saying I, I i think that everybody's valued an opinion and that sort of thing but they're just crazy just look at any independent film it gets trashed by this this culture of people that just do not have a clue about what what it means to make an independent film and how important it is because these are the seeds 
of the filmmakers that will go on. If everybody crapped on Hitchcock in his early days or crapped on Spielberg or well, they did crap on Lucas and everyone else, we would have lost these people who never had this great wealth of films that we have now. So anyway, that's, that's my passion. Well, bit about while, while Simon reaches for his heart medicine, um, <laughs> let me uh, let me let B jump in both uh, on those topics. And Sorry. B, let's hear, hear from you. I know you're, you're my co-host, but uh, <laughs> do jump in. I found everybody really fascinating, and I wanted to ask Simon earlier on, but uh, this this is probably with everybody, and including everybody in the comments as well. Move to your right a bit. You're sliding out of frame. Oh, <laughs> no, that's no the other, way, the, other way. the other way, the other way. There you that's go. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've got to keep it entertaining for those people watching. Yeah. So, um. Yeah, about keeping uh, one's proverbial pecker up. Um, you know, that, that's, that's very much the, the, the talking point since people have been brave enough to, uh, especially during this, this pandemic thing, talk about their feelings more. And mm. you know, you're saying how, um, you know, in this culture of uh, trolls now, that, you know, how disheartening it is. How, how, do, how, do, how does one keep their proverbial pecker up? Um, yeah. Yeah, personally, personally, I just want to, I just want to make films. I and you know, and that that's ultimately it. I just get really excited by putting, you know, filming some shots, putting them together, and seeing an audience reaction. That's that's it. That's the nub of why I do it, and that keeps me going. And I don't know what else I'm going to do. I mean, the thing is, I'm getting on a bit as well, and and I've spent years and years doing it. Now I'm actually, I feel like I'm just getting there. I'm just getting, you know, I've made the, I've, I've made two feature films now. One's been relatively successful. And uh, and there's more. I've got more in me, so I just want to make films. That's that's how I keep my pecker up personally. Yeah, and you can't, and you, can't let the, you can't let the trolls affect you. Um, as much as you can't you, you can't deny that they they are a problem and they exist, and you can't not hear those voices sometimes. It yeah, you've got to keep going in despite of them. And I, I just think it's to, to to trolls who you know who love to piss on indie filmmakers <laughs> i just say to them i would just say you get in the ring and you show me how you can do better you know and if you're not throwing if you are not coming down into the arena to fight the battle we fight for your entertainment and you just want to sit up there and you know hurl abuse and thumbs down or thumbs up us mm. well you're not in the arena there's you have no glory there's nothing for you. The glory is the person in the arena. They're, you're just a spectator. You're just your. So your opinion is as worthless as anyone else's. Doesn't matter. So you're not. You know they're not going to be remembered. There's nothing that they've created that is going to be remembered, and no one remembers the critic, and um, only the films remain. So well, you've got to just let those people go. Yeah, you know? No, I agree. I agree. Um, I, I mean, just, look. One, one point I'll make is, and I had this conversation with Jason Fleming, who you probably all know had his first directing debut um, with, uh, remember that, Eat Local, it was called, uh, when I read the script, it was called Rain of Blood, I think, Eat Local, you know, and that, that got pretty bashed. And we both, I had ongoing conversations with him during his production shoot of the issues they were having and what he was having to cut and what was having to compromise on. Just as I had conversations with both of you about your compromises, as you also had conversations, I remember, I remember phone calls with all of you, with a, one of us crying about something. <laughs> you know, one of us, oh, we can't, we can't shoot this today. We've lost daylight, or this didn't work, or the actor, this actor hasn't turned up, or I've got to recast, and whatever it was, you know, production issue. The bottom line is, all that counts is what's on the screen at the end, and. True. and Everything is so transient now. To get people engaged, and Toby Cockrell's made a comment about people's attention spans in the chat, and, and that it's not very long these days, and especially with the younger generation. I mean, you know, I have to instruct people to watch my film with their phone turned off and not on their yeah. phone. Um, yeah. So, you know, unfortunately, we, we live in a we live in a time when. Um, all that counts is the final product. No one cares how you got there. Yeah, other filmmakers care and people that work in the film industry care, but the people that are watching it, all they care about is what they're seeing on the screen. Is it engaging them? Do they want to watch to the end? And um, 
if we're completely honest with ourselves, I think we would all admit that the films that we've made are the best that we could achieve with the resources they had, but they were probably not the films that we started out to make. The, the final vision wasn't quite there. And people have often said to me, uh, you know, how happy are you with the journey? And I thought I'd probably give it a six out of 10 on IMDb, seven if I'm being generous, because there's this and this and this wrong with it. And yes, this is great. And this is great. And this is great. But this is disjointed and this didn't quite work. And I wish I could shoot that bit again. And I wish I could reshoot this bit again. And, you, mm. you, you know, and this hasn't worked and I might recut it and I might recut it. Um, what would you, Matthew, and you, Simon, give your film, honestly, out of out of 10 on IMDb yourselves? Yeah, I'd probably give it the same seven, maybe, at the most. <laughs> because, yeah, you, 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 well, what was in here was a lot better. That was the best I guess, the best you could do at the time with what I had. Um, yeah, and, um, yeah. But the, uh, going back, Lance, what you said, in, you know, in the end, people don't give a shit if you had to make this for 10 bucks or whether you had to make it for 100 million, um, you, what really matters is what money can't buy. And this is what something I really want to stress um, because you can spend $100, $200 million on a movie and the audience can turn it off in five minutes or walk away and go, that was shit. Mm. Yeah, that was Transformers 3, wasn't it? What's that? I think that That's was Transformers 3. 3. Yeah. <laughs> probably and, and cost that much and... They can have the same attitude to Transformers 3 as they can to your $50,000 science fiction film. They can have mm. the same attitude. So clearly it's not budget, really. I mean, sure, budget can really help, but it's the foundation of your story. And if it's engaging and if it's interesting and it's well-crafted and there's good craft and behind this, anything can be interesting. Like uh, Boiling Point, I finally watched it, Lance, and it's the story of a chef running a kitchen on one night and it's completely engaging and I can tell it's low budget and I can tell it's, you know, it doesn't have all the bells and whistles of a Hollywood film, but they can be damned. It doesn't matter. This is interesting and I'm enjoying it. And that's all. They Brilliant, matter. Brilliantly crafted film. I'm, I'm hoping to get producer um, Hester uh, Ruoff on the channel. Uh, I'm hoping she might come on with one of the producers. Um, I'm going to try and get Phil Baranthi on, uh, who directed it on our channel as well. So I'm going to be asking that. I don't know. I don't know if I want them all on together. I think I want to get a load of producers on for one episode, and I want to get a couple more directors on. And of course, Phil Baranthi, who directed it, was in Band of Brothers, one of the main characters in in Band of Brothers. He was in every episode. That's mm. where he met Stephen Graham. That's where they formed their work relationship. Yeah. And that's how he got Stephen Graham for Boiling Point, which also started life as a short, Matthew, like your film. <laughs> they did a 20-minute version of it. They did, they did exactly the same thing Yeah, um, as you. And but it's it got a fantastic you, cast, fantastic cast. Yeah, because um, it was well done. Despite low budget, doesn't matter. It's well done. And I think that's what, that's what audiences care about. Um, is, you know, they don't care about the budget in one sense. They don't care how much you spent on it. And that can go both positive. That's positive and negative. They can, you know, so uh, it really just comes down to the independent filmmaker needs to not worry about how much money they've got, but rather how can I make the best version of the film with the resources I have? How can my, how can I push my craft to, to, its, to its fullest in this little box that I've been given because I don't get the Hollywood box, I get this box mm. to play in. So make it as good as you can in your bar, in your box. So, yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. Somebody's uh, also said in chat, um, "Boiling Point" is awesome. We've got Robin Hayter watching, who was one of the characters in the BBC production, science fiction production that I know Simon's going to remember. Tripods. Um, he was one Actually, of the Robin Hayter. That never was. Yeah, he played. He played the French. Uh, I think he played the French character Henry of the Henri. Is he? Uh, does he got a famous dad? I have no idea, but he was in one of the Outcast productions as well. Right, so right, okay. He's also, a fellow Outcasts, um, is... and uh, you know, he's just made the point that as, when it comes to drama, script is king. Yeah, uh, V, I'm sure you'd agree with that. That script, script is king, uh, first and foremost. Ah, uh, script is um, king. 
Uh, you didn't ask me what I thought about my film, what, what rating I should give it. Yeah, well, you were hesitating, and, and uh, I thought you were going to sort of slide out the room quietly and uh, not, not reply. No, 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 seriously. No. Look, I, honestly, I'm yeah. going to go for a nine. I'm ah, going to go for a nine. Okay. And you know what? I know I'm, it's flawed. I want it, I, as far as I was saying, I gave it everything with what I had. But yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I, I, think it's got, I, I think it's got a spirit to it that's missing in a lot of uh, independent films. I haven't seen your film, Matthew, so apologies. <laughs> but yeah, I um, was going to see it now. But he okay, was, I'll he watch was the premiere. Yeah, was the premiere. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I'll yeah. on yours. But, um, but I think it's got spirit and it's got ideas and it's emotional and you have to think about it. And uh, it's a lot of fun. That's all I'm going to say. I'm very happy. It's a great actor that fires this tank. Uh, it, I think, it, that, yeah. I think yeah, that, well, you know, it's that takes from from six to a nine. <laughs> Maybe it's um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, Simon, before we lose you, because all right, because I'm going to disappear. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I, I know you've got to go soon. One question I, I want to ask every guest, and and we forgot to, well, we didn't forget to do it, but Jason, we only had him for an hour. Um, bless him. Um, what are the three TV shows you've seen in recent years that you proper rate, and also maybe a, a film or a show that is a guilty pleasure that perhaps isn't an obvious choice? So. Uh, Simon, we'll, we'll hear from that uh, before we lose you. Uh, okay, you. Uh, I couldn't. I couldn't think of any series. I, I, actually, I know that's ridiculous. I I really liked Bates Motel. Actually, I thought that was fabulous. Interesting. Um, yeah. I've not and, seen that. Um, what's that again? I've not seen that. Oh, it's it's really good, and it it, it syncs up very nice with Psycho, the original. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I heard nice things about it. Um, yeah, it's I, good. It's it's uh, they dragged it out a bit, but it's just brilliant. Freddie Highmore and. Um, um, yeah, I'll write him. Good he's idea. really good. He's really good. And and the yeah. woman, uh, Vera Farmiga, is fan fabulous in it. Absolutely fabulous. But um, so um, I couldn't think of it. I, right, you want to know about Boba Fett, right? I, I did. I've just watched. Have you watched it? I have seen it. Yet, yeah. go on. I, I think uh, it was about it was about I, a seven out of ten. That I how Boba Fett, the granddad years. Yeah, I I like the guy. I like the guy. I'm so pleased the Mandalorian was here. But uh, how on earth, I'm sorry, that the episode, a couple of episodes, the, the episode before the penultimate, the penultimate episode, rather, yeah. Yeah. it was, they made it boring. I'm sorry, it's got Luke Skywalker in it. It should have been, it was just boring. It's like, how can you make Star Wars boring? Yeah. Um, but I, but but they've got some, and these are really good filmmakers. Robert Rodriguez directed the last one, which was great. Great episode, really enjoyed that. Um, um, I just found it a little bit stretched out. I again. thought the fight scene was really badly choreographed. In the last episode, I thought it didn't make any sense. At one point, all the all the the rebels I've got to call them rebels because they're kind of rebels go. We've got to dig in here. And there's no logical reason for that in the fight whatsoever. And then they're literally seconds later, the robot shields that are surrounding these robots they drop, which is the thing that's stopping the lasers. From hitting the oh, robots yeah, was, and destroying the robots. Well, no, the Rancor did something or other. Yeah, no, no, the, yeah, forget the Rancor for a minute. Because I thought he'd shut the shields oh, okay. drop on these robots, right? And and all the, the rebels who've been firing at them for ages, yeah. not getting through the shields, don't fire and all going like this. And there's this, this this big pause and no one's firing. And I'm like, well, you can destroy them now. The shields are down. The I'm shields just, are down. This is Star Wars. The shields right, are down. Right. You can destroy we them. Know, we know that. I, I just, to be honest, I was I was a bit overwhelmed by it all because it was like wow. for about half an hour. Yeah, um, I mean, but, there were some yeah, good bits right. in the battle scene, but there were some bits it that was were all right. really naff. And I, 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 again, you've got a brilliant director at the helm. I love Rodriguez. I, yeah, yeah, I was me personally too. inspired by his book to be a filmmaker, Rebel Without a Crew. Followed his career from day one. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, did he make all the decisions? For that episode, probably I, you not. You know what? I wonder if they rush. They have to rush it because of deadlines. It felt rushed. Yeah, it felt. Uh, so did the other episode he directed with the Vespa one. That that. I mean, a weird episode. But they were, oh, anyway, I thought. I think the whole that the whole. Star I don't. Wars I don't want to. I don't want to slag off Star Wars because it's my religion. For those but, people um, watching, Simon is like the biggest Star Wars fan on the planet. He, he's of the generation when you queued up on a ten-mile line to get into I the did. cinema. To see I queued up, I queued up for 12 hours to get in, and uh, I was the first one in in Basingstoke ABC Cinema in 1978. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I know you've got to go, yeah. Um, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go. So, I'm listen, mate, this. before you go, I just want to say for those people watching, Simon is 
trying to raise money for Infinite Worlds, his next big sci-fi epic. Um, all of the stuff is already um, uh, below you um, on, our, on, on this actual video. You can see links to Simon's uh, uh, Twitter and all his personal information I was able to abscond from the internet. Um, he's selling mugs, um, coffee mugs. Now, everyone needs to buy a coffee mug once in a while, and Simon has a plan to sell 20,000 of these. I think it's 20,000. Have you got one, there you, can, you got one there you can show us? Uh, yeah, was two seconds. Oh, hang on, I'm just organized. Hey, Matt, your three recommendations uh, of TV shows you've seen that you've loved. Probably not by uh, I actually think, really, I'm really digging yeah, yeah, the love. Italian TV series My Brilliant Friend. Oh, okay. There we go. There's an Infinite Worlds. They look pretty cool, actually. Man. They are. They're nice. You should get one yeah. else. Very anyway, I do need to get one. I have broken no a few no, look, Can I vote very, very quickly about crowdfunding? Um, I've because I'm an old hand at crowdfunding now. I decided that last I did last one I did with Indiegogo, I raised eleven thousand. They took just over a thousand, and I thought I don't know if I want to do that again. So I've now set up my website. It's a dedicated sales site. So I'm selling merch, things like mugs and t-shirts and anything like that and that's bringing in you know and i'm advertising that so at least i'm making all the money back it's all coming ah, you're it. not having to give it to them that's a good idea no. if you do that that's great that's good yeah. i mean the, the urgency thing goes and you don't quite hit the algorithm but but uh, but my network has been pretty supportive and right and, and i'm just keeping it open as well i just keep keep it going i'm nowhere near selling uh, fifteen thousand mugs but um they do sell they're selling every day and and again it's real money that comes in yeah. So I'm using it to develop the film, so it's all good. Right. Anyway, guys. Fantastic. Well, look, Simon, we wish you every success. Thank you. Um, we'll have you on a future episode. Uh, all right, it's cheers. Has begun and we can maybe show a clip or, you know, see where you're at. Thanks so much for giving up your time and coming no, on. No, pleasure. And great to meet you, Matthew. And good luck with it all. And, and you yeah. too. Bye. And please good do. Luck, Simon, if you haven't already, please do like and subscribe to the channel. And we're, we're at very early days on this channel, but I want to make it, you know, the honest um, industry YouTube channel that people can come to for advice on all aspects of Just the be, industry. Uh, and we're gonna, it's going to be honest stories, no bullshit on this channel. So um, thank you so much for telling your story. Simon. Um, so Robin has answered you about his famous dad. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, it's James Hater. Yes, James Hater. I edited Robin. Well, look at I edited the video that uh, talking pictures all about your dad uh, with the interview with you. So, ah, there we go. I'm a, I'm a fan. I'm a fan of you and your More dad. world. And uh, he was in the last. He was in Children Film Foundation films. Um, yeah, God, back in the eighties, I think. That's going back. That's so, uh, yeah, he's a good chap. Nice. Chap. All right. Anyway, guys, I'm off. Now. Lovely to talk to you, mate. Um, I no doubt we'll speak again. Yeah, I will. Be all right. Back. I will okay, be guys. Thank and, you. Enjoy uh, the rest of the show. We'll speak See to you later. Bye. Take care. Ciao. Um, uh, this is such a lovely bloke. So, yeah, Matthew, so you were saying, uh, let's just talk before, you know, we'll talk about the, the cost as well um, before we wrap things up. But while we're on the, the subject of stuff that you've seen that you have liked um, or you've seen stuff that, oh, yeah, I'd like to make something along those lines or like that, films, TV, what you got? So you talked talking about an Italian show. Yeah, oh, you said, oh, what are, the, what are three three series that uh, you thought were really good? I mean, I always say, well, you know, Deadwood and Battlestar Galactica, they're my two favourites. You know, I love those those series. They're my favourite series. Um, but uh, recently, of, of all the new content that I've, I've seen, you know, I don't watch a lot of series, uh, but I really enjoyed the Italian um, series, My Brilliant Friend. I thought that was really, really good. What's the uh, what's the premise of that? Because I've not heard of that, and I'm pretty up on my European shows. So I'm surprised. It's, um, it's basically the story of just two girls who grow up in a very poverty-stricken area of Naples in Italy in the 1940s, 50s, as shows them being little little girls, and it just goes through their life as they grow into into teenagers and then into young women, and and how these two very different characters and women you know deal with the world around them and the and the problems of of, of that women were facing in that time um uh wow. you know, in italy and and what the world was like and how they're 
forging their way and had their relationship with each other and other people. It's really just a, it's just a glorified soap opera, but done really, really well. And it's got a period setting. It's set in Italy as well, which is a little bit different. And it's just really, really well done. So yeah, um, you and I both both love Italy, and we both love period stuff. So that sounds like a win-win for me. That's created. Definitely by check it out. It's a, it's, a, it's a good series, and it's not and and it's not afraid to. Um, and I think because it's Italian, it's just not afraid to get dirty, you know. And I think that's one thing that really bothers me with a lot of Netflix material and a lot of streaming material, and and certainly Disney material. Then they they're afraid to get dirty because they don't want to be seen as oh what will people think about this will it offend anybody you know but you know this yeah. film with this series is willing to go no nah, there's some ugly sides of life and characters are going to do things that are pretty horrible and we're going to show you and you're yeah, watching yeah. wow okay they went there okay I appreciate that's, that. that's created by Saverio uh, Costanzo I'm guessing that's probably on. Um, Netflix or HBO or something. I think it's yeah. HBO. It's a HBO that, that it went to, and I think that's why it, it's got because it's you know it's it's got it, it's willing to go places that other series and so on aren't. And I think that's probably a big problem I've got with a lot of films today and series is they're so homogenized because nobody wants to offend anybody or you know about anything, and so. Uh, and I've had that same problem with, you know, with my own scripts, a, a recent script that I um, I wrote has um, some very blatant racism in it, you know, because it's set in the, in the 1930s of Australia. And I wanted my villain in the movie to be very racist um, because I'm trying to set him up as the bad guy. I'm trying to show how terrible these attitudes were. And the movie has a very positive message about about you know, the, around the race issue and so on. It's very positive. But I wanted, I needed my negative character to be horrible and repellent to to sell that idea. But I, you know, I'm not making the film with them anymore, but I did have some producers and people come on board who were going to finance it, um, who was basically saying, if we're going to do this, you need to remove all that. You need to remove all the, those bad words. You can't have a film where people calling people those names and, and having that. And I'm like, are you serious? This is part of the story. I'm making a story that addresses racism and and the, and the, and, the, and, the, and the, the terrible horrors of it. I've got to show it, you know. I have, to, And it's my bad guy that's, you know, clearly. But, you know, they were just because they were being, they were treading too lightly, you know, and... I like it when shows and movies don't tread lightly. They 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 go all in and they and they hit you over the head and you go, wow, that's you're bold. You're going you're going somewhere bold. We're back in the nineties again when filmmaking was bold. You know. Hey, let's hear from you on that. What are your thoughts? Uh, well, I, I was fascinated because the first thing I thought is that no one's told Quentin Tarantino that uh, he can't, uh, you know, have uh, one hundred and seventy nine n words in one movie. I know, I know. Um, I think he's at a place where he can just do whatever the hell he wants and if anyone told him different, he'd just go, and he has. He just goes, well, who's who's stopping me? And he does it anyway. Sometimes but, he's just saying, he's just doing it for the sake of it. It's like he's got that N-word Tourette's. I think there was one, um, it might have been uh, Django Unchanged, where yeah. it was like, F you, you. Ending, 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 and 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 your ending mother and your ending sister and your end this and your, all yeah. every other word was and I'm like you literally just won a bet didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> but, but in the context that Matthew just mentioned of the script he was trying to get produced, what you, you know, what, Quentin Tarantino is in a in a sphere of his own. I was just say yeah, he's he's what, a whole other. Yeah. League. <laughs> what are your thoughts on what Matthew did, the point that Matthew just made about you know what he wanted to do with this script and producers saying you've got to remove that character? What, I mean, if you were producing that film, would you tell him to remove I, that I, character? I want to see it made. There's something you know that's, that's real about it that's not, uh, um, for want of a better term, uh, whitewashing. Uh, yeah. You know that um, it's an it's an important story to be made, and you can't you can't just suddenly. Um, uh, uh, sugarcoat it and, and and gloss over it. Uh, it needs to be it needs to be addressed. And uh, there's, there's a lot of people in in um you know in in uh 
in Australia now, I, I think they don't seem to appreciate how very damning and damaging um, racism is. Mm, that's right. And you've got to, and in order to address it, you need to talk about it or you need to show it. And you need yeah. to show it for how awful it is. And yeah. that's really what I'd written, a character that is truly awful and repellent. So people can watch that character and go, ugh, like mm. it is really a horrible thing and how the characters overcome it and so on. But if you go, oh, no, we won't put that in, we won't use those words, we won't show that, it's like, well, actually you are doing a disservice. Mm. You know, you you are in this sort of, in the, in this attempt to not offend anyone now, you're actually doing a disservice to the people who had to live through that kind of thing. Mm. And we're doing a disservice to people now by, by, by showing something, uh, a behaviour or an attitude that's completely wrong and teaching people a better way. And, we, and by taking that away for fear of offending anybody, we are doing a disservice. And that's one of the things that I think uh, is getting, yeah, like I said, this whitewashing, this homogenising of content is not allowing us to talk about the things that we want to talk about, like um, whether it's mental issues or racism or, uh, or abuse or anything, we kind of go, oh, let's not show that. That might offend somebody. It's um, we're, we're sort of cotton wooling the audience and rather we should be, as filmmakers who've got something to say, we want to sort of shake them out of their apathy and go, Look at this. You know, sure, this is an entertaining movie and you're having a good time, but wake up, look at this and challenge their thinking and uh, make them think a better way. And I don't know. Uh, that's what I think. I we think, think it's that. different. Sorry. Sorry. You go. There you go. You go. It's, it's, it's very different from um, statues that glorified slavers or abusers. You know, there's a film such yeah. as it's, 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 you're not glorifying it, you're showing this is. This is where we were. This is how far we've come, and this is what we still got to overcome. That's right. And this is what we don't want to go back to. You know, mm. <laughs> you know. That's one of the real things. That a lot of these things with films is is by essentially by telling the stories of what of the past, we can we can really make sure we don't go back because we can see in the story in the message of the story how bad and broken that is. And it sort of it's like that check that you can go, hmm, yeah, we don't ever want to end up in that war again or in that kind of conflict again because we're learning through film. You know, people learn through films, um, and I think that's uh, I think that really is important. That you know, ties into the, that ties in directly to the point I wanted to make, which is you do learn a lot through honest depictions of history. I mean, like no one really knew what it was like to land on a beach in Normandy until we saw the first five minutes of Saving Private Ryan. Yeah. The, the, the black and white uh, 1966 film, The Longest Day, didn't give you that same experience. Great film, though, it is. Um, you, you know, and I don't, I'm not sure that that opening scene of Saving Private Ryan would get made quite the same way today. There's a lot of sanitization of not just history, but of... of um, society happening in, in portrayals, mm. um, in dramas, which I think sets up a dangerous level of false expectation to the younger generation of what life is really like. Mm -hmm. I think you're mollycoddling a lot of people um, and, 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 and making people... Um, everybody gets offended so easily now. I, I, and stand-up comedy is, is a topic we'll save for another time because that's a big can of worms, but... I noticed that, you know, a lot of stand-up comedians, stand-up comedy has traditionally always been quite dangerous, has always has always trodden daring ground, has always used shock value for effectiveness, um, whether you like that comedian or, or, or not. I don't want to go to a Roy Chubby Brown stand-up <laughs> gig ever, but I also don't actually, in, in, the, in, a, in a society where we fought for democracy, I don't necessarily want to see that person get, uh, cancelled uh, or not or told he can't perform um, as distasteful as I might personally find his material that there's this freedom of speech thing that that it's a bit you know it's really tricky to navigate now because there are so many complexities mm. uh, around it um, and and that permeates 
the very topic we're talking about, how things get funded and, and how scripts get changed and shaped and things that people want to change or force on you or take out, like you were talking about. I think depiction, if you're doing a true story drama, which, Matt, I'm guessing the project you were talking about might have been, I think you owe it to your audience to tell the story truthfully. Yeah. I don't want to see a... Um, a really great film that I, I I think is one of Alan Parker's best films. It, uh, the, the late great Alan Parker, who of course directed my friends Graham Fletcher Cook and Dex in um, Bugsy Malone, um, he did a film called Mississippi Burning in 1988, which was a, a, a semi drama documentary, but also semi fictionalized account of the three civil rights workers that went missing and were murdered. I, I think the year was 64, V, that that happened. I'm, I'm, I'm reaching because um, my memory is not I'm great. Not of all things black, though. So I, I no, can't... no, I, I, I don't know. You, I don't want to get the date wrong. But I think it was 64 that that happened. It might have been 58, but I think it was 64. And um, that um, uh, depiction of um, that time was, I think, was probably one of the most honest depictions of that time that had ever been shown at cinema at, at that point and i know that it caused uh, there were fights in some cinemas in america and and there, there was a lot of um aggravation that came with the release of the film over there there was a lot of controversy opinion on it was very divided um but i but i remember an interview with parker and and he said well i tried to make the depiction of this as truthful as i as i could and i think <clears> if you're telling history you're telling anyone's story, whether you're semi-fictionalising it and changing the name or not. Um, and it's the same with Paratrooper, we're selling, uh, telling Sidney Cornell's story. As a filmmaker, you you have a um, duty to tell the story as honestly as you can mm. and, and not exaggerate or de-exaggerate as, as truthfully as you can. Um, it's yeah, not always people, possible. People are going to take the film as... People tend <clears throat> to take the movie as 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 a true depiction of it yeah yeah so whatever absolutely. you're putting into it is what they're going to go, come away feeling oh well that historical character was a prick or that historical character was wonderful so you've got a yeah you do have that duty of care in, in one sense you've you're sort of you're carrying the torch of of history in one sense and, and you need to have respect for it and i think yeah I think that should be in the forefront of any filmmaker's mind, and, and or any documentary filmmaker as well. If you're carrying yeah. that torch, what are you carrying? Um, just be honest, you know. And if it's ugly, it's ugly. If it's going to offend someone, so be it. Um, if it's important to tell that story, just tell it right and be honest. Uh, don't 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 get too upset about how the audience is going to feel, you know. What's so. Like just giving out a shout out to a couple of our audience uh, people. Uh, Wyatt Noel, one has just said, "Great show, thank you so much, Wyatt. That that's great." Um, and following Matt's example of engage with your audience, um, Amelia Goldie, um, you know, thanks for the story, great information you shared. Uh, Fritz, um, uh, yeah, he played the character of Fritz in 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 um, Tripods. Uh, as, by the way, has said, "I have seen um, the Legend of Ben Hall, and it was great." Ah, oh, that's there great. You Thank you. Thank you, Fritz. Uh, and Nerdly UK has their recommendation for a great show is Money Heist. And Nerdly UK is also asking, where can I find um, Ben Hall? I'd like to hear a couple of recommendations from you in a sec before we ask Matthew about the cost. But Matthew, where can people find Ben Hall? I think, I mean, I know it's on DVD and Blu-ray release in the in the UK. I've got my Blu-ray in the other room. Uh, yeah. Where can um... see it? And it's on, on any he's streaming in the UK. Um, I'm not sure yeah, what. Yeah, he is in the UK, I assume, because his name's Nerd. Yeah, in the UK. yeah. Um, I'm not sure <laughs> in the UK which streaming platforms have it. Um, I'm only aware of the ones in America. Um, you don't get HBO Europe there in the UK, do you? Uh, since Brexit, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe we um, don't. Um, yeah, I'm still, I'm, to be honest, I'm sorry. I don't know in the UK where you can get it. Um, you may have to just dig around a little bit to find it in the UK on a streaming service. or It's probably available on video on demand somewhere in the UK. You probably just have to dig around for it. I'm afraid I, I don't know offhand. Uh, Nerdly um, UK, if you, want a, if you want a physical copy of it, you'll find it at FOP. Um, 
in uh, London's West End, which Matthew is where I took you when you when you're on your visit to London, and we went in that shop. And you went, oh my God, look at all these Blu-rays, and you <laughs> came out with a big stack of Blu-rays. As you yeah, can tell, yeah. I'm a big collector. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. That's, that's only half that, the collection. E eBay is a great place to also grab Ben Hall if you want to get a copy. You'll find plenty of copies there. So, um, but good luck hunting it down. I hope you find it, um, and um, I hope you enjoy it. Nerdly, if you do come back on another uh, program, let's know what you thought of it. Um, v, what are your recommendations of stuff you've seen recently? So we've got a great one from Matthew, my brilliant friend, which I'm going to track down. Uh, and Matthew, by the way, you know what? On that subject, let's try and get Severo Costanzo, who is the creator of that show, on this show. Oh, that'd let's be good. Try get, let's try and get him on this show. And if we can, you can co-host it with me and we can talk all about Italian television. And I'd love you to. And I are both massive fans of Italian TV and Italy in general. So I'm going to try and get him. Oh, to come why on. not? And I'll be on that. All right. Well, we'll work on that. So V, you're, what, what, what were you seeing recently that's blown you away? TV drama wise recommendations. Only dramas. I was going to start off with. Um, since we've, we've been uh, very drama based, I was going to uh, talk about first of all ghosts. Ghosts. BBC thing is that the people who um, responsible for um, uh, horrible histories. I know exactly the show you mean, which has got. Yeah. I really love um, the tall actor Simon. Um, basically, Matt, it's about a load of ghosts that have died in a house and they're all stuck in the house and this new couple inherit this house and one of them, one of the couple can see the ghosts and the other one can't and the ghosts are all from different eras. And, it, yeah, it is, I've got to agree with V, it's a really well-written, quite witty. Oh, cool. Um, is it comedy or is it drama? Yeah. Comedy and it's the, there was a show in the... Um, in the 80s, I think, called Rent a Ghost. Oh, God, yeah, yeah, I remember that. Over there at all? Have you seen any sort of uh, um, Rent a Ghost? Rent, uh, Matthew? Uh, no, I, I, no, I haven't seen that, no. I mean, yeah. I wouldn't go out of your way to dig that up, but oh, no, I haven't heard of it. Oh, I loved Rent a Ghost. It was, I loved the, maybe the theme tune more than anything else, but um, I think that's the only thing I liked about it. Oh, I got it. Mm. It. There was just something about it. This is kind of like a 21st century rent a ghost for adults. Ghost. Yeah, with a much better script. I mean, yeah, the jokes yeah. are actually funny, you know. But I, I, um, for some reason, as a child, I don't actually remember much scripts for anything at all. I think I must have been like the, the water where I was growing up. I just spent a lot of time just like literally just zoning out in, the, in front of the box, but thinking I liked something, but not actually remember anything about the scripts at all. So it's. Um, it's kind of like got that sort of nostalgic feel about it, but it's really very silly. So you've got a guy, the tall guy who plays a um, a, a Tory um, minister, a conservative uh, minister. Yeah, that's, uh, that's the actor I'm telling you about. I love that actor. He was also in The Detectorist. He had a supporting role in The Detectorist, another great BBC show with Toby Jones. The Detectorist. And, and I'm Simon Fornby. I just remembered his name. Yeah. The reason I can't find it is I'm looking at the American remake of the show on IMDb. I'm thinking, what? who are all these actors? They no. have already, V, I shit you not, they have already remade it. It's up on IMDb. It's even got reviews, 7.7. .7. Matthew, if you're going to watch it, watch the original BBC one. Mm, okay. Um, I yeah. doubt the American remake is as good as The Office. They never uh, usually are. Body in it has died over a 100-year period, so you've got a caveman, and then you've got uh, some... Yeah in time so you know nice. um, it's how they all interact and and it's 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 hilarious so that i'm in Far farnaby Far simon farnaby is is one of the leads and he's also one of the creators of the show and i know the cast have a lot of input on the scripts on the show the horrible mm -hmm. guys it was it was always a collective thing that they um, did, yeah. did ever seen horrible histories i've seen a couple of it's it's not heard true. of it not seen yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it's one of those one of those shows, Matthew. You can tell everybody got on. It's mm. got that energy from the cast. Uh, yeah, yeah. They, they, I mean, it's not one of the ones where they're the only ones having a laugh, and you're not, fortunately. Um, okay. Is is it is, is a really funny? It's a nice like you want a half an hour episode or something before you go to bed to like, make you have a giggle. Mm. Good show for that. Okay. And cool. V, something else maybe in a more serious vein. Right. So. Ooh. There's a couple. Well, am I getting a word in? Yeah, go jump. 
Um, so uh, yeah, there's a couple. There's um, Euphoria, which is another HBO thing. I don't know if you've seen that, Matthew. You were talking about um, HBO before. Uh, so, Euphoria, yeah, yeah I've, I've heard of it. I haven't seen it yet. So Lance has seen the first season. The second season is currently going. It's um, Zendaya. Is, is that how you pronounce her name? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I was when I spoke to her at the uh, premiere of June in the UK. I think I mispronounced her name. I think I called her Zendaya. And um, but she didn't correct me, fortunately, um, for the two minutes that I got to speak to her. But but I thought she was amazing in Euphoria. Her acting standard went from you know, exactly. I still do a few things. Yeah, it gets better because she's she like, was, she's like a model, you know, gorgeous, gorgeous um, young woman. And in the second series now, she's she's let herself go. Like you can, I've got like um, a really high definition screen. And you can tell that isn't that someone's painted on bad skin. You can see that she's like proper been rubbing chip fat into her skin so that you can get really up close. And she, um, she's a, a drug addict in it. And there's um, an opening scene in, I think, um, episode six, where she's literally got a long stream of snot coming down out of her nose. <laughs> Just to, to get in that deeply and that sort of. Um, so it's it's actually it's a teen teen drama which d don't let that put it put you off it's not very no old. yeah I think you'd actually Matt you'd, I think you and Nadia would probably quite enjoy it I mean season one has got a very unusual ending that I don't want to spoil mm. which makes you go uh, I need to rewind and just watch that again did that just happen but mm. um, but it yeah she she really anchors the show V um, it sounds like it's a show that's willing to take some risks. Oh, oh, definitely. In, in in so so many ways, there's, and it when when eventually, if you write it down, when you get to uh, episode um, five of season two, there is um, it's a chase scene that every two minutes, or not even two minutes, every twenty seconds, you're oh, oh 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 oh, it's one of those. I love those those things where you just go, oh god, how, oh god, how do they do that? Oh my god, look out, look out, and you're jumping up and and shouting at the screen. With it, so write that down for um, episode five, see, um, season two. Euphoria, it's, brilliant. Yeah. Do you have a guilty right. pleasure, V, like a, a horrendous reality television show that you can't not stop watching or anything like that? I'm liking, um, what's it called? So, um, celebs go dating, okay. Um, and I do no, no, better still, The Mask on BBC One. Which is so cringe, but I can't stop watching it. So it's um, that guy that looks like he's Chinese, but he's not Chinese. Um, dark hair. I forget what his name is now. But I watch it every every uh, Saturday. And so you've got um, not the mask. Sorry, the wheel. The wheel. The wheel. Um, so you've got a whole lot of celebrities who are supposed experts in their field, and. Um, then you've got uh, members of the public in a w an inner wheel, but they're on underground. And every now and then they get popped up to answer some questions to win a whole lot of money. But in between each round, for some odd reason, they have to sing the theme tune as they're going round and round in a circle. And all the celebrities do these odd dances to, you know, the, 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 the theme tune, the wheel, the wheel, and they're going, why are you doing this? What money are you getting paid to do this? What for yeah. some reason? And it's Michael McIntyre who hosts it. I can't stop and, it. And before anyone complains, he's actually made that joke in his autobiography, which I've read. Yes. The, yeah. One of the first questions you always get get asked is, oh, are you Chinese? Hmm. Um, I, I'm sure he made that joke. Yeah, I'm going to make, um, say that. Otherwise, say uh, I wouldn't. Uh, but there's nothing wrong with looking Chinese. I, I can tell that both Matt and I probably feel that that's the sort of show that we'd have to be physically tied down and restrained and forced <laughs> to watch um, <laughs> over our usual content. But you know, um, listen, V. If you can convince Michael McIntyre to come on the show and talk about it, I'm up for it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, then, I'll, then I'll watch some episodes as research because I, 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 I confess I like him less when he presents shows. I love him as a stand-up comedian, which mm. is why I read his autobiography. I just love his observational humour. It's all so relatable. And, mm. you, you know, every sort of situation he talks about, we've all been there. Um, he's, he's just got such a warm way about him, but I just I, I don't understand who... It's so American, the, the, the thing of, like... 
these you know celebrities in a in a circle and then been spun round while singing the theme tune for like twenty seconds. It's it's so it's really unnecessary. But each time it happens, I'm like, here they go again. What dance are they going to do? You know, what, what chair dance is this? this one? And half the, the celebrities who've got that these specialist subjects, no bugger all. Right, and they've got members of the public who could possibly win like ten, tens of thousands of pounds, and they bank on them because they say I'm an expert in such and such, and then right, they go away. Well, um, by the way, Suzette just right. messaged me telling me to hush my gums a little. I've no idea what that means, but it's probably because I've been eating a bag of um as we've been doing the stream because i didn't have time to cook dinner because i had a, a, a an hour's writing session with someone i'm helping them edit their novel um before this and before that i had another hour's appointment with somebody else all online no mm. time to cook dinner so I, i've been it's, munching it's hard, it's um, it's hard for shut, shut up basically how's she gums no uh, well i'm just letting this is it um, um I want to talk about Matt's film before we kind of bring it to a close. We've been on longer than I thought we were. We've, we've been on a couple of hours, um, which is fantastic. And I, I, I think actually we've talked about a, quite a wide range of not just crowdfunding, but we've talked about quite a wide range of topics, um, all really useful stuff for aspiring uh, filmmakers or filmmakers already in the trenches, actors as well. There's been some great information from there. Matt as well. Um, we definitely want to have you back. I mean, uh, for example, we might do a show on, uh, you know, what directors look for in auditions and casting and that kind of thing, and maybe do one all about casting. And I think we might have a casting director and a couple of directors on for that. So maybe we can have you come back for that, if that would be uh, an idea for you. Sure. Um, uh, and, um, well, of course, we'll do another show on, you know, riding horses. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> you can tell us all the stories. But... Um, I'm going to recommend a couple of shows before we just we we wrap up with just talking about the cost and do a little plug about that for Matt and he can tell us a bit about it. Um, the shows I I would recommend or that I'm watching religiously at the moment are Billions. Um, really love the actors. Um, some some seasons have been better than others, but I love the actors. I love the actors. I love the characters. The actor who plays Wags, oh, my God, I really want to work with that guy. And I've actually followed his career for a while, even before he was in Billions. Uh, I love Billions. Ozarks took me a long time to get into it, but it's it's fantastic. Um, Jason Bateman is the master of the understated performance acting class. Uh, he's just a, a phenomenal actor. He's also the producer. I think he co-wrote it. Um, it's in its final season now, and I want to um, give a shout out to the younger actors in that cast, one of whom I'm told looks like a younger version of me. I'm not sure if that's true. And if it is, mate, I'm really sorry, um, you know, but I'm sure you're going to mature at a much better rate. Just don't go into directing or producing and you'll be fine. Um, but um, I'm just going to give these people a shout out because there, there are two actors in ozark the 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 girl who plays uh matt you haven't watched it have you the, the show i don't think no i've seen ozark i mean briefly it's about a man who launders money for the mob um his fat his, his wife knows what he does this has been his career for most of his life and he moves to kind of a remote part of pennsylvania in, in order to um set up a new life and a new identity and leave his past behind and he ends up getting involved with a, a sort of local load of criminals, and inf he ends up becoming a bigger criminal than he ever was. So there's oh, yeah. kind of tonally, it's not dissimilar to Breaking Bad. Um, the first season is quite hard to get through, and you, you may engage in the first season and go, "This isn't really for me." I personally would recommend if you have the time, you push through the first season because it just it's like a slow kettle, and it really boils fast. Uh, as it as it goes on, it's got Laura Linney in it, who I absolutely absolutely love as an actress. Yeah, she's, good. she's fantastic. Now the the two actors I want to give a shout out to are um, Charlie uh, Tahan, who plays the role of White Langmore, who uh, some people say looks like uh, me when I was young. 
Um, sorry, Charlie, about that. Uh, Julia Garner, who before this, who plays Ruth Langmore, um, Wyatt's brother, uh, sister, sorry, um, before Ozark, she, she'd done quite a bit. I mean, she'd been in the industry for a long time, and I remember her in the miniseries Waco, which was a really good drama documentary on the, the Waco scene. She had a great role in that. Uh, really did love that show. If you haven't seen it, it's a, a great account of what happened. So she'd done a fair bit. But in in this role, she really got to show her range. And it's a, a character very different um, from anything she's played before. So Julia Garner, if you don't get an Oscar in your lifetime, I'd be very surprised. Uh, I think you will. Um, you're definitely going to get an Emmy if you haven't got one already. She may well have an Emmy. I don't I don't keep up with these things. If she hasn't got one, I'd be surprised. Um, so, yeah, that's a recommendation from me, um, Ozark, um, Billions, and Succession. Also love the actors, love the writing. Probably the only show I can watch where all of the characters are awful and I'm totally invested. Mm -hmm. For a show to achieve that, is a, that's a fantastic skill set. To, to Because normally yeah. if you can't invest in the characters, why would you care about them? But they're also deliciously horrible. It's just watching them is just a delight to just watch them tear chunks of meat off each other. Yeah, um, it's a fine line to walk, isn't it? To have a a, 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 a completely re repellent character that you can't start watching um, because it can, if you're not careful, it can go both. It can fall. You, you can you can disengage, but done right, you can't take your eyes off it. I, I mean, it, you know, everybody used to love watching Dallas back in the day, the American soap, big hit in the 70s and the 80s, because everybody watched it because of J.R. Ewing. He was the ultimate bad guy and you hated him, but you loved watching what he did to people. This is like watching a show with 10 J.R. Ewings in it, all doing that and and... You know, and, and you kind of one minute you're rearing for, for one of them because you kind of like them over another. Then they do something even more awful. So then you change camps and you're on the side of someone else and then you're rearing for them. It's just brilliant. Uh, again, first season, quite hard to get through. You've got to push through that first season because these shows always take a while to find their feet, I think. Um, mm. But Succession now, you know, me and Jason, we're sending each other pictures of it on WhatsApp when it's on. Oh, this seems good, you know, and um, great show. So to wrap up, we're going to uh, let Matt talk about the film he's making at the moment. Not crowdfunded, Matt, this time. You managed to get, you put some money of your own in and you got some from a distributor. Is that right? Uh, not not quite. Um, I got all the money for this film largely, well, the way it started was all free private money. Um, private private had, investors. Private investors. I put in some myself, um, but I just had a pool of people um, that were willing to help. Um, you know, ten thousand here, five thousand there, eleven thousand there, two thousand here. Um, who just were people that you know could spare that money and um, knew that it, likely that they'll see it back, but they weren't in any hurry to get it back, and uh, just believed in what I did. Some didn't even read the script. They just knew it was another film I was making and they just wanted to help. So, um, yeah, that's how we got it off the ground and we filmed most of it that way. And then and a lot of those people I'd established those relationships in the Ben Hall period. And then um, we had shot, you know, 60% of the movie. We still had some money to, to keep going. But then um, the... I, I managed to get the film to, to some people who own a production company and they saw it and they really liked it and they put up some money to finish the shoot and also to um, to take it into post-production and, and produce it as though it was a $1, $2 million movie. Um, so we're sort of getting, you know, we sort of shot it for under 100000 and we're going to get all the post-production, you know, to the level of a $2 million film in post-production. So, we uh, so we've shot it cheap and we're going to end it expensive. Uh, which is good. It means we'll, we'll have a lot of money in post to, to really, you know, jazz up what we shot. So um, you tell, tell the viewers, with I mean, I've seen it. I don't want to say too much myself. Could you tell the viewers and also my uh, co guest co-host, V, maybe, you know, give them a brief, what is the cost about? Why should they want to watch the film? What's what, you know, what's, what is it? 
Sure. Well, uh, as a story, um, it, it revolves around two men who decide to take, I guess, justice into their own hands. Um, they it, It's set over a 48-hour period with these two men that execute um, a plan to get hold of someone that um, they believe has wronged them and actually has wronged them in the past and they get hold of uh, this individual and they take him out into into the bush and they're going to they're going to exact their revenge fantasy that they've been wanting to do for you know over a decade and the story is about what happens to them when faced with doing what they've always wanted to do and it then shows the i guess the deterioration or the breakdown of the you know, of, of, of what it is they're doing and the choices that they're making and this story ends up spiralling, you know, out of control. So it really does ask the question about, it, it, it asks a lot of moral questions about what is, you know, what's the cost of doing these, of making these choices and also what is the, you know, what, you know, what is the true nature of revenge or justice and where is that line, where do you cross it? And, um, yeah, so I, I hope it's a film that challenges viewers and, you know, to really think about what they think about um, and how they emotionally feel about revenge and justice and capital punishment and all these kinds of things and just, you know, so it's a, a character piece that explores those themes. Um, and it really just came about because I had, I wanted to make another film, but I knew I couldn't have, I couldn't do it expensively. I couldn't, I didn't want to run down another crowdfunder. And uh, I had to do it with, you know, three or four actors in a very limited location and I just had to write a story that was going to be interesting and would keep someone's attention for 90 minutes for that. Um, so, it's not, yeah. it certainly kept my attention for uh, 90 minutes uh, and I've got to say the performances of the three leads, absolutely out, outstanding. Oh, I meant to put this hat on when you came on. Do we get to see why they're seeking revenge? Uh, yeah, the the movie does tell you why they're seeking revenge. Absolutely, uh, I wouldn't want to say it here, just so it doesn't give anything away for those that, who are going to watch it. Um, but the movie does um, tell you why they're seeking revenge, and it's and it is a reason that most people would say would agree with, and most people would go, "Yeah, I'd probably do the same thing," and that's kind of the question the movie's presenting. Okay. You probably want to do the same thing. Okay, let's look what happens when you do that. Yeah. Let's look at what happens when you essentially act out of that sense of, you know, righteous justice in yourself. But there's a darkness there as well. And there's, and, and, and you can, you know, so it, it sort of just lays it out for people to, to go, well, there it is. And this is what it looks like. And this is what it might have, what, what could possibly happen if you did it? Uh, it doesn't. It's not like a revenge film where it's all you know Hollywoodized and everything. It's it tries to just say, here's two very ordinary people doing something extraordinary that we've probably all thought about, that we've all fantasized or you know hypothesized that if this terrible thing happened to me, I'd probably want to do this, and it explores that. So, mm. all right. And well, look, that, um, I'm going to recommend it because I have seen it. Um, I mean, it wasn't graded yet and all the bells and whistles, um, but uh, I really enjoyed it. Um, so did our mutual friend who, who watched it. So that's the cost. And he's, just, like, he's just joined on uh, on chat. Gary Bolter says it's fantastic. Everyone should see it. He says, oh yeah, yeah, it. yeah. That's right. And <laughs> Gary is also a member of the Outcast Creative and one of our one of our other members in Australia. So, um, is it called where can we find it? Well, it's not out yet. Okay. No, it's not, it's not, I showed Lance and Gary my rough cut. The film will be finished by mid year, um, mm -hmm. around July, and it will be ready for viewing probably. In, in you know within two or three months after that so hopefully by before the end of the year people will be able to see the cost yeah cheers um, so so well i think we're going to wrap things up uh we've been on <laughs> quite a long time uh what we're going to do is um following in the traditions of um 
uh, the other YouTubers that I've seen. We will do a breakdown of kind of what topics we discuss, uh, where I will have to put the show on in the background tomorrow when I'm working, and uh, I will do a, a sort of edited narrative which will go below this video later. So if you're interested in crowdfunding, or, uh, you know, you want to hear Matthew's dog barking in the background, you'll know where to find those important mm -hmm. topics uh, as and when they uh, come. Uh, Matthew, um, you're, you're quite hard to find on social media. The only link I could put uh, for people to follow was the Ben Hall Twitter account um, below. Is there any other uh, ones we should add to that? Um, there is a... There is a uh, the Ben Hall the Legend of Ben Hall page on Facebook. There is the Cost feature film uh, page on Facebook. They're probably the two best to follow because I regularly up, put updates in those. Um, that's because probably you, two, you haven't got your website, your Two Tone Pictures website. I website. don't have a Two Tone Pictures website. Um, it's yeah. sort of one of those to do list things that I've never got around to. Um, right. And so no, I just it's only Facebook at this stage. So. Um, that they're the best way to keep to follow what I'm doing is those two pages. Fantastic. Okay. Well, look, those people that tuned in and asked questions, um, great that you did. I know there's a lot of people that want to watch this show who were out tonight at various uh, functions and things. Um, most of our lives will all, always be on at this time on a, a Wednesday. Um, of course, we are also going to be doing reviews. Um, it won't just be me from the Outcast Creative doing the reviews. There will be other members of the Creative. Uh, chipping in with those they tend to fall into two categories we are um reviewing um forgotten gems and um sort of older films from before the year 2000 that you might not have seen uh, films or shows um, the first one of those is going to be the long good friday um i've already written the script for the review for that that'll be dropping uh, i hope next week um and then we are doing the best of british drama and we dropped our first review for that, which was Ricky Gervais's Afterlife, which I thought was absolutely fantastic. And uh, general consensus from the Outcast creative as a whole was that the show left everybody crying at the end. I think for, for a show to be able to achieve that is, is no um, insignificant thing. And, it, you know, really, really good show. That's another recommendation from me. Um, so... Uh, I've just had, um, I'm currently trying to fund my film, Falcon, love to talk sometime from White Null. I don't know who that question is directed at, but um, perhaps maybe the last note to say for anyone trying to get their film funded is there is no magic answer to that question. Um, crowdfunding has worked for some people. Um, it has not worked for others. It's a challenging route to go through now because it's very oversubscribed and also people are not as um, confident to invest in crowdfunding as before. Um, different routes will work for different people at different times and sometimes it's just about getting lucky. Matt, anything to add to that? Yeah, look, I think it's it really is about do you have – do you honestly have – is, is – it, you think you've got to ask yourself. It's a hard question to sort of put to somebody. Um, to Who's this person, their name? Uh, Wyatt. Wyatt. Is, Wyatt. is what you've got, your film, do you genuinely believe that it's something people want? Like is it something unique? Is it? And if, if it is, then you've got a chance. If it's just something you want to do and it's just, you know, it's like anything else, then maybe maybe it's not, you know. You've got to be able to sell that to them. And I think that's the way, the only way to succeed is to sell people your idea and make them want it so badly that they will give money that they'll probably never see again to make it happen. You've got to, like, you know, it's like investors. They're not charity people, they're investors. So get people to invest in your crowdfunding campaign, not charity. Um and just make sure that all your materials that you're putting forward, like your pitch book and your posters and, and, and the campaign itself, if that campaign looks professional, is slick, is well-oiled, well thought through, and it's just brilliantly executed, they will immediately think that if you can do a crowdfunding campaign this good, then you're going to make the film good. But if your campaign is sloppy and badly worded and your pitch video is amateur and all this 
why would anyone believe you can pull off a feature if you can't pull off a great pitch video and a great campaign? So, yeah, yeah, you've got to really make sure you've got something that people will want and people will want to put some money up for. So make it about, make don't make it about you and your passion and your film. Mm -mm -mm. Make it about your product and how much everyone wants your product. That's my greatest advice for crowdfunders. All right, Matthew Holmes from Australia, thank you so much. Uh, v, anything to add before we go? Uh, well, there was a couple of people had some questions that weren't addressed earlier on. But I I'll thought we now. covered it. I thought we got all the questions in. Um, pretty, sure, pretty sure I brought them all in. Um, okay. Pretty, all right. Yeah. I'm well, pretty sure we did it. We're pretty sure. I mean, I'll, I'll, I will double check. And uh, if I'm, we didn't, we'll address them on the next stream. But uh, no, I'm I'm pretty sure I covered them all. Scrolling back through, I don't see any that I. I am uh, very intrigued. Um, do's and don'ts we kind of covered. Yeah. I'm yeah. very intrigued with the name Seven Foot Penguin Overlord with Gravy. Yeah. Um, he retracted a lot of messages, but uh, um, okay. was, uh, yeah, and I, I know he was led here by a critical drinker. <laughs> um, but he's also a Brit, I believe. So, um, mm. yeah, okay. Well, look, I want to thank um, our guests, um, independent film directors Simon Cox, who left us earlier, and uh, Matthew Holmes, who's just about to start his day as we're wrapping up ours. Um, oh. All the links for their stuff will be below. I'd like to thank my guest co-host, V Marshall, who's currently working on a documentary, which she's trying to show us, but I'm trying to terrible lighting. We just can't see that. Yeah, so yeah. I'll, put, I'll put links, I'll put links underneath that people can read up about it. And we're gonna have you back, V, anyway, to talk about that another time. Buy this book. It's by um Arusha Qureshi and it's called uh Flip the Script. Oh, so. flip the script, very good. Very good book, yeah. Very right. Good book. Okay. Right, fantastic. So, uh, thanks for tuning into the Outcast Creative Industry Interviews. We'll be back with another one of these. We hope in two weeks uh, there'll be some reviews and things dropping in uh, before then. But uh, until that time, um, do take care out there and never forget to tell those you care about that you love them. And we'll speak to you again soon. Bye, y'all. Thank you.